be seated for why does truth matter and how can we reach it? Please be seated for why does truth matter and how can we reach it?
Good morning. Still morning, no? <laughs> Late morning. Um, to, in, to reflect on the theme of this year's encounter, this urge for the truth, uh, we knew we needed uh, somebody with heart and mind. And that's why we invited Prof Professor Waldstein, a good friend of the encounter, a good friend of Father Giussani, a good friend of mine. And, um, and I'm sure that Mikael will help us uh, understand the magnitude of the theme and also it will help us do it in light of this publication. It's sold out already, so don't worry. You gotta buy it some other way. To give one's life for the work of another, which is a book by Father Giussani, published, just published. And, and in a sense, it's also the way in which we try to live the encounter as volunteers, giving our life for the work of another. Just a few biographical notes about Professor Waldstein, and then of course, as always, you can go to the website and you will find pages and pages. Michael Waldstein is a professor of New Testament at the Franciscan University in Steubenville. Before this position, he was the Max Seckler Professor of Theology at Ave Maria University, where he became the first endowed chair of that university. He also served as the founding president of the International Theological Institute in Gaming, Austria. He is the author of various books, and the last one of which has been published uh, this past September, Glory of the Logos in the Flesh, St. John Paul's Theology of the Body. So let us welcome Professor Waldstein. Thanks, uh, Thank you very much. Bishop Christoph Pierre, fellow bishops, my friends on the path of the charisma of Don Giussani, I'm happy to be here and share with you. Yesterday I ran by accident back there into Bishop Pierre and it was a stab of joy for me. He remembered that 20 years ago we presented together the religious sense in Uganda. And I remember the memory came back to me then, the deep humanity and clarity of his analysis of problems in Uganda. What a name, Christophe Pierre. Christ carrier close to Peter. That's, that's where we want to be. Um, your sermon reflected this perfectly. So I thought the best way to give my lecture would be in one word, ditto. <laughs> Though I promised that I would do a talk, and so the second best we'll have to do. Why does truth matter, and how can we reach it? And taking off from the book, to give one's life for the work of another. Here's an overview of the chapters. There's an introduction, I'll talk about what Giussani calls the sign, his testament in a way, the brief formula, Veni Sancti Spiritus, Veni Per Mariam. It's like a dense jewel that needs to be unpacked. The rest of my talk is an attempt to unpack it with the help of that recent book. Then on Nietzsche and Giussani on reason, then a brief personal testimony from me, 
And then the main part of the talk is about that sign, that diamond that Giussani left us. First, the danger of the sign to be reduced in our scientific technological culture. Then the sign in his new book, a parallel with John Paul's theology of the body. And finally, the sign in the Gospel of John. That bluish screen will appear every time in a transition from one section to the other so you know where you are in the talk. This is what uh, Don Giussani says about this diamond. I have applied in recent times, I have discovered in recent times with all my heart, deeply moved, the most complete formula that can be conceived from the Christian point of view. Come Holy Spirit, come through Mary, veni Sancti Spiritus, veni per Mariam. Now you could say, well, where's Jesus in this? Come Holy Spirit, come through Mary. That's, Jesus comes through her. A painting by Titian that portrays the moment of the Holy Spirit coming through her, into her, in the incarnation. Close up, if you look at this angel, a substantial angel, it's like a 500 ton interstellar battle cruiser <laughs> coming down to, spiritually speaking, of course. <laughs> and here, the coming of the Holy Spirit in a stream of light. Further up close, the angel Look at the wild hairdo of the angel. It's, it's remarkable. And look at the dignity of Mary. There's a sense of, the angel says, do not be afraid. There's no panic fear. She draws her veil in front of her face, leans back her head a little bit, but there's a, there's a tremendous sense of composure at the same time, of peace. This is what Giussani says about Veni Sancti Spiritus Veni Per Maria. Virgin, pure and beautiful. Beauty is the sign. And she is, as it were, a sacramental sign of the beauty of which, and there the Italian is per cui, which could also be translated by which, because of which, for the sake of which, God made the world. So then I'm glad to have left you a reminder of this rising, always rising glory of our Christian life, the Vini Sancti Spiritus. You will see the key terms of my talk are going to be sign, beauty, and glory. In Bolivia, the Jesuits had founded in the jungle, in the villages, many communities that were extraordinary in their development. They taught them many, many things, among them music by the avarice of Portugal, of Spain, and of other powers. Those villages were destroyed. The old women in the villages preserved sheets of music. I don't know if after a few generations they knew what it was. Then there's, there was a Polish priest, a musicologist, who went through the jungle, befriended these old women, and collected these pieces of music that hadn't been heard for several hundred years, many of them composed by Indians. And I want to give you one example of that. 
it's on the beauty of Mary. Sung by Indios. For me, this resurrection of texts kept by the old women for centuries is a symbol of what Giussani did. Take the texts of the past, but that they are alive in the present. He quotes St. Augustine, in our hands are books in our eyes, facts. In our hands are books, but we would not know how to read them without the other clause. In our eyes are facts, present facts in our eyes. Of course, Augustine is also thinking of Jesus. The Gospels talk about Jesus. That's a fact in our eyes through the text, but I think he means the present also. The presence of Jesus is nourished, comforted, proved by the reading of the Gospels and the Bible. But it is assured, it becomes evident among us through a fact, through facts that are presences. Maybe Archbishop Dolan thought of presences as one of those obscure terms, though it's something very simple. You are presences to me now. You're here, I see you. Your reality impresses itself on me. So the next section, Nietzsche and Giussani on reason. This is part of the topic that has been assigned to me. Oh, 
Oops. One day, the wanderer slammed the door shut behind him, came to a halt and wept. Then he said, this penchant and urge for what is true, real, non-apparent, certain, how I hate it. Nietzsche, son of a Lutheran pastor, there was a lot of irritation and anger with, but he points out the inevitability of this search. In the same book, much earlier, there's another aphorism which complements this one. And I, I find that a fantastic effort, aphorism. Most people lack intellectual conscience. They don't find it despicable to believe this or that and to live accordingly without first becoming aware of the final and most certain reasons for and against. What is the good of being good-hearted, subtle, even brilliant, if those who have these virtues tolerate limp desires? F fabulous expression, limp desires in their beliefs and judgments. If they do not recognize the desire for certainty as the innermost desire and deepest need. Among some people I found hatred against reason. And I respected them for it. And this way at least their bad intellectual conscience betrayed itself. But to stand in the uncertainty and ambiguity of, Christian exi of human existence and not to ask, not to tremble with the desire and thrill of asking, this is what strikes me as despicable. What I look for first in every person is this desire. When I encountered Giussani first, I was struck exactly by this, by the intensity of his desire in raising questions and the pursuit of certainty. This is now from To Give One's Life on page 53. We cannot start off except from a love for reason, from a trust in reason. And this has made us perceive the value of reason as the first thing to clarify, which he does in the religious sense. If you look at these angels in Titian's um, Annunciation, in particular, if you look at these two faces here, they're Profound faces, thoughtful faces. They look down at the event of the arrival of the Holy Spirit, of the incarnation of the Son of God, with, yes, with reverence, but it's not a superficial feeling. There's, there's depth and permanence of thought in their faces. Interestingly, there's also one angel here who seems to be somewhat distracted. Um, also, he's, he's quite ugly. The, the others are beautiful, but uh, I think this is in a way for Titian to generate contrasts. From the religious sense, reason follows different methods develops different paths, depending on the object. The method is imposed by the object, Angel. Reason is life. 
a life faced with the complexity and multiplicity of reality, the richness of the real. Reason is agile, goes everywhere, travels many roads. The same angels from somewhat closer up. And then, maybe my favorite text from the religious sense, the only condition for being truly and faithfully religious, the formula for the journey to the meaning of reality, is to live always the real intensely, without preclusion, without negating or forgetting anything. This amazing angel, it's an event, an encounter that she did not exclude. Reason is awareness of reality according to the totality of its factors, often repeated in the religious sense. But here in the new book, in many places, also a good other formulation. Reason for us is the need for a total meaning. It is openness to reality according to the totality of its factors. That God is all in all, and we'll talk about that in a, in a minute, is a deep expression of reason for us, an opportunity to fully affirm its value. Let it be done to me according to your word, which your bishop spoke about, is an expression. God is all in all. Now, a brief testimony. How I met Giussani first and um, became involved in the movement. But it's not an image of the Madonna, not painted by Titian, this particular one. But I, I, I love it. Whether you call it beautiful, yeah, it has its own beauty. It's not, maybe beauty is not the right word. I was at the University of Dallas in 1981, finishing a doctoral thesis on beauty, philosophical account of beauty according to Hansus von Balthasar. And in Dallas, at the University of Dallas, there was nobody who really knew Balthasar very well. I studied philosophy to prepare for biblical studies. So in the fall of 81, Susie, my wife and I, we had one child then and one on the way. We moved to Rome and I wrote a letter to Balthasar asking him, are there any people in Rome who know your work? And he gave me two names, Jacques Servet, who is now head of the Casa Balthasar, and Mark Wellet, who is now prefect of the Congregation for Bishops. So I became friends with, with these two men. They led me to Santa Maria in Trastevere, where the mass of the movement took place on Sundays. And it was, we were both absolutely amazed by the vitality, the beauty, of the service, and then afterwards in the whole piazza, which is a great piazza, everybody gathered and there was a lot of, a lot, a lot of talk. And there we met Massimo and Carmen Borghese in particular and became friends with them. They accompanied us. Massimo took me for the, to the first event with Giussani. I remember it exactly. As, as, as if it were yesterday. It was on building one's house on rock rather than sand. And I remember he, he 
knocked on the table, bang, bang, to indicate the solidity of rock. Of course, it was wood, but with his words, it sounded like granite. Um, it made a huge impression on me. We went to a number of events from 81 on, um, but Rome is very difficult. Often, America is called the land of unlimited possibilities. Susie, my wife, taking children to the doctor, filling out forms, etc., came up with the expression, land, excuse me, Italy is the land of unlimited impossibilities. <laughs> In the spring of 84, when I had finished the licentiate of the Biblicum, I was admitted to the doctoral program in New Testament at Harvard Divinity School. And in the same year, 84, there were spiritual exercises with Giussani in Fuji, south of Rome. And I talked to him, and he said that they were sending Cialini to Boston, Washington, and New York, three to Boston, so I offered to help them get settled. And we began doing a school of community. And through the friendship with them, we became involved. So 1981 to 2022, that's now 41 years, and it's been worth staying. An important factor for me was in those first years in which Giussani had sent Italians over to the United States, he came frequently to the United States to give talks. And since I knew Italian, I was the one who translated usually for him. So I would sit next to him. There he was. And he said a sentence, and then I would translate it into, into English. And I fell in love with him. That's the only way to, to say it. If beauty is maybe not the right word, falling in love maybe not exactly the right word, but that's what it was. I wanted to remain in contact with that sign of life that I saw in Giussani. To live the real more intensely. Membership in the movement had a huge impact on my professional life as well. Not only um, my personal life, when I went through Harvard Divinity School, most of my professors were unbelievers. Some of them were believers. It seemed to me a little bit like these manuscripts preserved in the jungle of music that nobody played. Is it a cooking recipe? Is it a magical incantation? What was done with the biblical text was a huge variety of things. so far for the testimony. The sign reduced in our scientific technological culture. In a key text, Descartes, and he expresses the spirit of the age, says this, it's possible to reach knowledge that will be powerfully useful to life. And instead with the theoretical philosophy, which is now taught in the schools, we can find a practical one by which knowing the force and the actions of fire, water, air, stars, the heavens, and all the other bodies that surround us, as distinctly as we know the various skills of our artisans, we can employ them in the same way for all the uses they're fit for, and so make ourselves these words really have to sink in. Masters 
and possessors of nature. That was the great ambition. Now, if that is the ambition, making oneself master, certain consequences follow. Leon Cass, in an important book, spells them out very clearly. Seek knowledge, and knowledge will give you power. But it would be more accurate to say that the new science sought first power over nature and derivatively found a way to reconceive nature that yielded the empowering kind of image. Seek power and you will devise a way of knowing that gives it to you. And that knowledge, not surprisingly, is mechanics. I will skip the Aristotle account of mechanics. Um, it combines mathematics with physical observation. Francis Bacon, who was also one of the main proponents of this revolution, says, Aristotle said it best. Physical observation and mathematics generate practical knowledge or mechanics. Now, mathematics deals with quantity, with items that can be set in quantitative relations. And in the new approach to knowledge, what can be grasped mathematically tends to stand out as clearly known and objectively real. Whereas, what can't be grasped mathematically tends to be seen as a mere subjective impression, as a mere appearance, projected like a movie onto the indifferent screen of nature. Because nature looked at mathematically is indifferent. Here's Giussani's analysis of the phenomenon. The reduction that takes place for man, insofar as he gives in to the common mentality, is a division, a separation, the struggle between sign and appearance. And as a consequence, the reduction of the sign to appearance. The more we realize what a sign is, the more we understand how vile and disastrous it is to reduce a sign to appearance. Goodness, beauty, this is me speaking now, life, knowledge, love, male, female, the divine, none of these can be grasped mathematically. And many people take account of that by saying, those are not facts, those are values. And values are personal or social preferences. And the axiom, very widespread, is you can't argue from facts to values. For example, biological sex signifies nothing for what it means to live one's sexuality as a man or a woman. Gender is a social construct or a personal preference. There's a Jewish prayer which has come under some attack, but Maybe I'm misunderstanding it, but I understand it differently. Baruch Ata Hashem Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shelo Asani Isha Blessed are you, Hashem, the name, they don't pronounce the divine name, we say Lord, they say Hashem. Eloheinu, our God, King of the universe, for not making me a woman. If you look at that statement from the point of view of identity politics, it's a put down. But when I thought about this prayer, I thought, what if I were a woman? Then I would have probably to be married to a man. And that doesn't attract me in the least. <laughs> the apparent gender euphoria in that statement is not a euphoria about the male sex, but about the feminine sex, because men are oriented toward women. On the day of our wedding, this was the image of my wife. 
That's what I was attracted to. That's where I was glad not to be a woman. <laughs> because I wanted this woman. And I wanted to have children with her. These are the first two children. In the background, you see our first, and in the foreground, our, our second child. And since then, the number has grown considerably. Um, the oldest on the left is 41 years old, and the youngest on the right is 21 years old, and they do various things. But in the middle is my wife, and I still think she's immensely beautiful. I wanted children with her because she was beautiful and attractive. And, and there they are. The sign now in Jusani is to give one's life for the work of another. And I'm going to approach it from terms that you're more familiar with, namely encounter and mystery. In Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, you have this exchange. Ah, Juliet, if the measure of thy joy be heaped like mine, let rich music's tongue unfold the imagined happiness that both receive in either by this dear encounter. So their encounter is an event that takes place that contains in itself the promise of a rich future. It takes staying with the event to discover that future. Of course, Rome and Juliet both die. Also, what Juliet says is fantastic. Conceit, where, where conceit means not illusion, but imagining something future. More rich in matter than in words. They're but beggars that can count their worth. But my true love is grown to such excess, I cannot sum up half my sum of wealth. That's, that's the nature of encounter. Promises, sometimes our confidence in that promise can wane, but it's there. In Shakespeare's Tempest, there's a similar scene. Prospero, who is the main character, his daughter Miranda, and he hopes that she'll fall in love with Ferdinand, because that would reconcile much. Fair encounter of two most rare affections. Heavens rain grace on that which breeds between them. Then Ferd Ferdinand asks her, wherefore weep thou? And she, and, and here again you see the nature of an encounter in its future. At my unworthiness that dare not offer what a desire to give, namely herself, that's what she wants to give, much less take what I shall die to want, want in the sense of be without. A text of Newman that comes very, very close to Giussani. The outward exhibition of infinitude is mystery. And the mysteries of nature and of grace are nothing but the mode in which its infinitude encounters us and is brought home to our mind. So there's something finite, but it contains, it expresses a depth that's inexhaustible. But now to Giussani. And here a different image of, of Mary we're going to focus on the beauty of Mary. This is the great image of the Assumption of Mary in Santa Maria Gloriosa dei Frari in Venice. Now, a series of Giussani texts. They're hard, so bear with me. 
I think they're the central part of the book, of, of the new book. Um, mystery, in other words, God, and sign. So he begins the sentence, then he has a parenthetical remark, and then he returns to the sentence, mystery and sign, okay. In other words, contingent reality in as much as it is always, as it always recalls something else. Even the tiniest stone, in order to be itself, has to be conceived of as made by God. Has to be a reminder of the source of being. Mystery and sign, in a certain sense, coincide. In the sense that the mystery is the depth of the sign. The sign points to the presence of the deep mystery of God the Creator and the Redeemer of God the Father. In looking at this image, the top of the ascension, you could raise the question, well, what's the representation of God? And you can give two answers, I think. The light that comes from an immeasurable distance, it's a tunnel of angels that goes back and back and back and you lose sight of the end. And then in the foreground is the dark figure of the Father, it seems to be both are representations of the divinity. Mary is at the moment before she sees. She doesn't see yet. She looks in a different direction. She would have to turn around to see God. The sign indicates the presence of the mystery, of the deep mystery. Mystery is the depth of the sign. It points out to our eyes the presence of something other. Presence, easy. It's there. I encounter it. Of the deep mystery for all things. It points it out to our eyes, to our ears, to our hands. An echo of first letter of John, beginning. The mystery becomes an experience through the sign. Of course, the sign par excellence, and that has to be said right away, is the cross. And I'll return to that. This is again Titian. It's a very high painting, and most of the drama takes place in the heavens. You see the lightning coming down, and the flow of blood and water from his side. So, mystery and sign, in a certain sense, coincide, and the mystery becomes experienced through the sign. This explains to the Christian the value of the sacraments. When he discovers that the whole of reality, another key word for Giussani, close to present reality is what you can actually bump into. It imposes itself by its presence. Is built of this method of God the Creator Reality comes from the Creator, having within it a reference to the Creator, which it demonstrates. In the intimacy of our relationship with things, it brings out the perception of another, of something other. You see this in the stretching out of the disciples here at the bottom of the picture of James in the orange on the right, John in the orange on the left. They're similar in color to Mary. Here a text where three times he begins the sentence and only the third time does he conclude it. It's a, it's a hard text. Oops, I wanted to go back. Pazienza with the electronics. Okay. So, mystery and sign in a certain sense coincide. And the mystery becomes experience through the sign. This explains to the Christian the value of the sacraments when he discovers that the whole reality is built of this method of God the Creator. 
Reality comes from the Creator, having within it a reference to the Creator, which it demonstrates in the intimacy of our relationship with things, it brings out the perception of another. Sacrament is different from all the other signs. Here is the threefold sentence. In the sacraments invented or created by Christ with the purpose of generating a new people in the world so that it, that is that people, might flow like a river into the waters of the sea of mankind as the initial revelation within history of the infinite mystery that man goes to meet at the end of his days. It is the beginning in history of the eternal. And again, starting, in the sacraments created by Christ, by the God-man, by God who became man, Jesus of Nazareth, he was the one who made them. He was the one who suggested them. In the sacraments, the sign reaches the point of complete identity with the mystery, as in the Eucharist, there it's he himself. I will go on ahead a little bit. The sacramental method. How much our spiritual life has to be disposed according to the sacrament. In fact, what is changed under the impulse, the light and the tenderness of baptism and the other sacramental signs is called church, mystical body of Christ. So, reali so, reality made as a sign of God leads everything back to the vision of Christ. Treating creation well means knowing Christ in order to know God. This is the beginning of a change in man. The stretching up of these disciples, it's a huge change in them. And the beauty of Mary is central. Now, a parallel with St. John Paul's Theology of the Body. In one of the talks of Giussani, he reports that John Paul said to him that the method of the movement is also the method he, John Paul himself, embraces. Let's go back to the Giussani texts explaining this jewel, Veni Sancti Spiritus, Veni Per Mariam. Virgin, pure and beautiful. Beauty is the sign. And she is, as it were, a sacramental sign of the beauty of which, by which, because of which, for the sake of which, God made the world. So then I'm glad to have left you a reminder of this rising, always rising, glory of our Christian life, the Veni Sancta Spiritus. The first manuscript page of St. John Paul's Theology of the Body is this. In the left corner, you have AMDG, at Maiorum Dei Gloriam, to the greater glory of God. In the right corner of that first page, you have Tota Pulcra is Maria, you're all beautiful Mary. Quote from the Song of Songs, where it's, it's not Mary, but my friend. It's the antiphon for the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And the date on which he wrote that first page is 8 12 74. That is December 8th, 1974, which is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. One of the most remarkable things about the human body is its expressive power, a portrait by Titian. But even if we look at each other, we see each other look. The spiritual inner reality is accessible to us. It's not true that matter is a neutral screen into which we project things. The same, or in a way similar, about the feminine.
The sense of interiority in that phase is overwhelming. So John Paul says, the body, in fact, and only the body, is capable of making visible what is invisible, the spiritual and the divine. It has been created to transfer into the visible, into the visible reality of the world the mystery hidden from eternity in God, and thus to be a sign of it. In man, created in the image of God, the very sacramentality of creation, the sacramentality of the world was thus in some way revealed. In fact, through his bodily visibility, through his masculinity and femininity, Man becomes the visible sign of the economy of truth and of love. In a book that's available out there, this is not so much self-advertisement, but I think it's important to, for us as a movement also to become aware of, of John Paul. Uh, I wrote a book, The Glory of the Logos in the Flesh, on Pope John Paul's knowledge of the body, and it's permeated by insights of Giussani that I learned. This is the outline. I won't go into detail on that. The sign in the Gospel of John. That's the end of my remarks. First, the purpose and structure of the Gospel of John. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciple, which are not written in this book. This is at the end of the gospel where he states the purpose of the gospel. But these signs are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Signs are central. The book itself is a writing of signs. That's the first purpose. Signs lead to faith and faith lead to, leads to life. Here the image of John contemplating. Now an image of the outline of the Gospel of John. It begins with a week. It ends with two weeks, the Passion Week and then the week of the Octave of Easter. On the right side you have what John calls in a very particular sense signs. The first sign is wine at Cana, then come two healings, the fourth sign is bread, then comes a healing and a raising, and the seventh is the blood and water from his side and the unbroken bones of the lamb, the paschal lamb, the flesh of which is to be eaten. Do you see the Eucharistic arrangement of this order of signs. They are ever doing with time to be. In the prologue, the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. We rightly say when we say the Angelus and dwells among us, because the Greek is iskenos and enhemin, and that's pitching the tent. And once you've pitched the tent, you live in it, so you're there. He doesn't break down the tent. And we have seen his glory, glory as of an only begotten from the Father, full of gift and truth. And there's a bridge between that verse in the prologue, 114, and what the evangelist says at the very end of the first sign in Cana, turning water into wine. This Jesus did as the beginning of signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory. Excuse me. This Jesus did as the beginning of signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. A brief look at glory, at least, we need to take. Because glory is, is, is a rich term. Try to unfold it in seven 
steps. Glory is light. The sun looks down on everything with its light, and the work of the Lord is full of his glory. This light is communicated, but it remains mysterious. The brightness was like the sun. Rays came forth from his hand, where his power lay hidden. There you have the sign. You have something in the foreground that suggests something deeper. It has power to transform. We are transformed into the same image. It's close in meaning to beauty. Jerusalem put on forever the beauty of the glory from God. It outweighs everything. The sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with that glory. And it's inexhaustibly rich because the love of Christ surpasses all knowledge. Um, Chosani loves, and you spoke about the opening scenes of the disciples staying. Since my time is short, I will skip through that. It's amazing, staying turns out to be uh, remarkable. For example, in, in 15, staying, the same word as where are you staying in the stage with him, returns in this way, I'm the true vine. Stay in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it stays in the vine. Whoever stays in me and I in him, he is the one who bears much fruit. If anyone does not stay in me, he withers. If you stay with me, in me, and my words stay in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. What is it that we wish? We wish happiness, fullness of life. This is what Jesus holds out as the promise. Cana and Golgotha. Cana is the first of the signs. Golgotha is the last of the signs. And the amazing thing is that John constructs these two scenes exactly in parallel. If you look on the left, you first have the place and the person's presence. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana. The mother of Jesus was there. Those are the only two scenes in the Gospel of John where the mother of Jesus is present. So she's already there, and Jesus is invited. She's like the book ends. She remains at the end. Well, the soldiers did this, standing near the cross of Jesus where his mother and his mother's sister Mary. Then comes an introduction to Jesus' words. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they don't have wine. When Jesus said, when Jesus saw the disciple, saw the mother, most translations say his mother, but it says the mother in the Greek. Big difference. He said to the mother, woman, look your son. Then he said to the disciples, look your mother. And in Cana, Jesus said to her, woman. In all of Greek literature, there's not a single example where a son addresses his mother as woman. Otherwise, it's quite regular. Jesus addresses the Samaritan woman as woman. But to address one's mother as woman is strange. But woman is the name Adam gave, according to the Septuagint, to Eve. My hour has not yet come. The hour of Jesus is the hour of his passion. So Jesus seems to understand the invitation of providing wine as the arrival of his hour. I think already in view of, of Golgotha. From that hour, the disciple took her into his home. Then his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And this is what Jesus does. After to this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, so the scripture would be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. Then you have the water jar, six 
stone water jars were standing there. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. There's a good wine. There's the previous wine that ran out. And there's the sour wine of the passion. For the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons, which is a total of about 1,000 regular size wine bottles. If you have a wine cellar of that size, you have, you have a lot. Jesus said to them, fill the water jars with water, and they filled them to the end. And these themes of fullness return in the parallel. There's a jar, he drinks it, they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a branch of hyssop, held it to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the sour wine, he said, it's finished. Then he bowed his head and gave over the spirit. Then comes a scene of recourse to the responsible person to order things. It's the chief steward and it's Pilate. But the end is important. You have kept the good wine until now. When they came to Jesus and saw that all, that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. That's interpreted as being, he is the paschal lamb, the bones of which are not to be broken. The flesh eaten, yes, but the bones not to be broken. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once came out blood and water. Seems very evident that in this parallel, the good wine, in a way, is a pre-announcement of the Passion. Just as the Mass now is a memorial, Cana is a pre-memorial of the Passion. This Jesus did as the beginning of signs in Cain of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. One more item from the slideshow. Which is decisive for Giussani, namely the unity of the church a sign. In chapter 17, Jesus prays twice for unity, patterned in exactly the same way, and the commandment of love in chapter 13 is the same. So let's take a look. I do not ask you for them alone, but for those who believe in me through their word. That all may be one. And now pay close attention what being one means here. It's not simply a horizontal unity between human beings. That all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they too may be in us. Being in us is the mode of union. But then decisive, that the world may believe that you sent me. So the unity of Christians is to be a visible sign, a persuasive sign, a missionary sign, as you put it, Archbishop, of, for the world, it radiates out, so that the world may believe that you sent me. That's a future desired result that the Father will bring about in good time. But there's already something present. The glory you have given to me, I have given to them, that they may be one as we are one. And now again, observe exactly what the relations are. I in them and you in me. It's a descending line, the Father in the Son, the Son in us. That's Christian unity. 
that they may be completed into one, that the world may know that you sent me and that you loved them as you loved me. And John formulates the commandment of love in exactly the same way, following the same structure, these two that clauses sandwiching the as phrase and then the consequence. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you too may love one another. In this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. If you allow me then to return to the beginning, if I still have three minutes. Thank you very much for listening. Pardon? I just, am I on here? I want to just say thank you to Professor Waldstein for this profound and deeply contemplative introduction to Jasani's work. Thank you. Thank you, man. Good. At 12.30 p.m. on the second floor in the auditorium, facing unsettling questions, eyewitness accounts from the front line of healthcare with Christiana Ferrario, Frederica Fromm, and Enrico Grignetti. And we will be back here at 2 p.m. for another exceptional presentation. Without truth, there is no reconciliation. 
a face-to-face -face conversation with Brian Stevenson, founder and executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative. And now is the time to visit those wonderful exhibits on the fifth floor, check out the food court, and please take a moment to give us a donation. All of this work depends on you. Thank you.
at 2 p.m. Without truth, there is no reconciliation. A face-to-face -face conversation with Brian Stevenson, founder and executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative in the main floor auditorium. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated for Without Truth, There is No Reconciliation in the Main Floor Auditorium.
Thank you. <laughs> I was telling Brian that he's used to these Madonna mics. I'm not. Um, but I welcome everyone who is here with us at the pavilion and everybody that is uh, watching online. Um, I'm very happy to be here um, to uh, discuss this uh, intense topic. Without truth, there is no reconciliation. And uh, my name is Esmeralda Negron. I'm uh, a lawyer, uh, an assistant public defender in um, Palm Beach County, Florida. And I've been practicing uh, that law, criminal defense, since 2017. Uh, I first came in contact with Brian's work through my boss, who requires a reading of his book, Just Mercy. Um, Mr. Stevenson, Brian, is, um, is the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative and um, a giant in the criminal defense world. So I, I feel uh, I'm, I'm before him uh, in awe and with a little bit of fear and trembling. But <laughs> he's such a gracious man that uh, I, I'm, I'm actually quite looking forward to this conversation and not as nervous as I thought I would be. It's, it's all you. <laughs> but if you want to know more about Brian, there is an extensive bio at the New York Encounter website that you can certainly um, take a look at. His accomplishments are many, many. Um, in my view, his biggest accomplishment is um, the substance of his person and his heart. Um, I heard someone say in a HBO uh, special called True Justice, uh, a colleague of his uh, say that Brian is the work. And so we're here to talk about that work and what it means. So here we are. Here we are. <laughs> um, Can I break protocol? Absolutely. One way, I just want people to know how thrilled I am to be here, but I'm especially thrilled because um, the folks who I think of as my people are in this space and there's a group of people sitting on the front row in this space from a place called Joseph House in Florida. And they are people. Uh, <laughs> uh, they are people who know, who know firsthand the, the problems created by our criminal legal system and the challenges and I'm honored to be in this space with them, and I'm especially honored to be in this space with one of my beloved clients, uh, a man um, I've known for several years. He was 13 years old when he was sentenced to life in prison without parole in the state of Florida and spent some excruciating years in adult prisons navigating violence and abuse and trauma, but he has this beautiful, beautiful spirit, and that prison was violent and abusive, but it could not take away that beautiful spirit. And he and I have been in prison cells and laughed and embraced one another, and he represents the joy, the humility, the humanity that I want everybody in the world to see in the clients that I represent, the people I represent. And so I'm especially honored to be here with my brother, uh, the beloved Joe Sullivan. <laughs> Brian, you can break protocol anytime you want. <laughs> <laughs> I invite you to. Well, thank you. So I want to begin by simply telling you that uh, a few weeks ago, uh, myself and Alberto that you met went up to the Legacy Museum. And um, I drove up from West Palm Beach to Gainesville, and then we made it a day trip, and we went up there. And what I want to say is that I walked into that museum. While I was there, I felt embraced and welcomed, even in front of all of the uh, really hard things that I had to look at. Um, you know, you begin with the history of, of racial injustice, which begins in the 17th century. Um, you walk in and literally you are overwhelmed by the, the gravity and the depthness of, you know, just the horrors um, uh, that is our sad history of racial injustice. And then you're carried through the different periods, you know, segregation, uh, desegregation, um, lynchings, um, some incredibly poignant 
panels and short films, and then you get to mass incarceration, um, and, you, and, and you wonder. But when I walked out of there, I didn't feel crushed and destroyed. I felt hopeful, really hopeful. Um, hopeful that there's a way to move forward. So I'm going to ask you a question. Some people might say, why look back? Why not simply look forward and begin from now? Uh, the civil rights movement, uh, uh, affirmative action, all of these gains that we've made, um, why, why do that? So how is it possible to confront the truth of our history of racial injustice without fomenting a greater divide. And I felt that. I didn't feel that there was a divide there. I felt identified with what was in that museum. Well, I do think that the only way you can heal a wound is if you diagnose the nature of the wound. We have an understanding in this country that uh, to get past high blood pressure or diabetes, you have to first make a diagnosis, you have to first understand what that means. Nobody's going to sign up for chemotherapy or radiation treatment unless there's been a diagnosis that there is a cancer that could kill them if they do not address it. And I think injustice operates in the same way. If we do not acknowledge the ways in which we have become compromised by inequality and injustice, uh, we will ignore it, it will fester, and it will kill us. And the truth is, is that we've never really acknowledged the harm created by our history of racial injustice. We are a post-genocide society in this country. And it doesn't matter whether you live in Florida or California or Oregon, no matter where you live in this country, you live in a space where the atmosphere has been contaminated by this long history of racial inequality. And a lot of people have argued that these contaminants will eventually dissipate. I don't believe that. I believe we're going to have to do something to change the environment. And that means talking about things that we haven't talked about. We have never really talked about the fact that we are a post-genocide society. I think what happened to indigenous people when Europeans came to this continent was a genocide because we killed millions of native people through famine and war and disease. We made them leap. We kept their land. We kept their words. Half the states in America are native words. But we made the people leave, and we did not acknowledge the suffering and the violence. And we were crafting a constitution that talked about equality and justice for all. At the very same time, we were denying basic humanity to millions of indigenous people. And we reconciled that by creating this narrative of racial difference, and it was that narrative that then made us tolerate uh, two and a half centuries of slavery. And I just don't think we've ever acknowledged it. We haven't talked about it. We haven't understood the way in which it created harms for everybody. I don't think the great evil of American slavery was the, the involuntary servitude or the forced labor. I think the real evil of slavery was the narrative we created to justify enslavement because people who were enslavers didn't want to feel unchristian or immoral or unjust, so they created this narrative that black people aren't as good as white people, that black people are less human, less capable, less worthy, less evolved, and that narrative which facilitated this ideology of white supremacy has never really been acknowledged. We passed the 13th Amendment, uh, which uh, ended in voluntary servitude, except for people convicted of crimes. Uh, but it didn't say anything about this ideology of racial hierarchy. And because of that, we then lived through a century of terrorism and violence and lynching, where black people were pulled out of their homes, beaten, tortured, drowned, lynched, sometimes on courthouse lawns. And that presumption of dangerousness and guilt that was created by that narrative continued, and it continues today, uh, and that's why somebody like Joe Sullivan can be wrongly convicted and spend decades in prison for a crime he didn't commit. That's why even I, as an attorney, can go places. Um, you know, I argued the cases at the Supreme Court that resulted in these wins, was going around the country, you know, enforcing that ruling, and I would go to courtrooms in the Midwest, I'd have my suit and tie on, I'd be sitting at defense counsel's table, and the judge would come in, and get angry. And you've been in these courtrooms, you know what that's like. The judge would say, hey, hey, you get back out of here. I don't want any defendant sitting in my courtroom without their lawyer. 
And I'd have to stand up and say, oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Brian Stevenson, I am the lawyer. And the judge would start laughing and the prosecutor would start laughing. And I'd make myself laugh because I didn't want to disadvantage my client who's more vulnerable than I am. And, um, and then we'd do the hearing and afterward I'd sit in my car and I'd think about the fact that I'm a middle-aged black man, I've got all of these degrees, I've got all of these honors, I've got all of these awards. And in 2022, I am still required to laugh at my own humiliation to do justice for my clients. And so for me, that has to change. And that is the, the vision behind the museum. When you go to South Africa, there's an apartheid museum that documents the horrors of apartheid. When you go to Germany, to Berlin, there's a Holocaust memorial that documents the horrors of a of the Holocaust. You can't go 200 meters in Berlin without seeing markers and stones that have been placed around that city to make sure everyone knows they are trying to reckon with the Holocaust. And as a result of that, there are no Adolf Hitler statues in Germany. There are no memorials to the perpetrators of the Holocaust, the organizers of the Third Reich. But in this country, we haven't done that. And I live in a region where the landscape is littered with iconography dedicated to honoring those who were the defenders and perpetrators of that. And so the museum is an effort at truth-telling, but you're right, the goal is not division, the goal is redemption. I'm not trying to talk about this history because I wanna punish America. I'm talking about this history because I wanna liberate us. And people of faith understand that there has to be confession and repentance if we're going to get to redemption and restoration. And as we say at the end of the museum, the purpose of the museum is to create a world where the children of our children are no longer burdened by the legacy of slavery and racial injustice and racial hierarchy, but to create that world, we've got work to do. I've personally... <laughs> We do have work to do. I've, I've seen it in the courtroom with colleagues that are black um, that are asked this is the very same question you are asked. And, and public defenders who are in the courtroom all the time. Um, so it's difficult to, to watch that. But I'd like to talk about a little bit about um, your history because I think that as I've gotten to know you through books and uh, different talks that I've heard you give, um, you talk a lot about your family, and, and rightly so. Um, you talk about your parents, uh, your brother and sister, and you also talk about your grandmother. I was quite moved by a story that you told that I'm going to let you tell, but I, I want the question that I have is because you, you're, you don't have this ideological spirit, you don't have this divisive spirit. How, how, do you, how are you able to foment such hopefulness where does that come from? Where is the source of your hope? And I can't help but go to the beginnings, right? Your family. Can you talk a little bit about how they've influenced you? Oh, absolutely. And it, 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 it's interesting, when I was younger, I didn't talk about it as much. But as I've, I've gotten deeper into the work, I've had to examine those same questions about what will sustain me. And I have talked a lot more about my family because I think, when I, when I think about their lives and what they've done, I, I find in that um, truths that I need to hold on to. My great-grandfather was enslaved. My great-grandparents, James and Victoria Baylor, were enslaved in Caroline County, Virginia. And despite the fact that anti-literacy laws made it illegal for an enslaved person to learn to read, it, you could be sold, you could be killed, you could be imprisoned. My great-grandfather learned to read while he was enslaved as a teenager because he believed that one day he'd be free. And I think about that because there was nothing about life in Virginia in the 1850s that would suggest that freedom was right around the corner, and yet he had that belief. And from that, I draw the conclusion that I have to be willing to believe things I have not seen if I'm going to make progress, if I'm going to push forward. And um, after emancipation, my grandmother told me how people would come to their home every week and my great-grandfather would stand on the porch and he would read the newspaper to formerly enslaved people who didn't know how to read. 
And it made her so proud that he had that ability to read. And she would sit next to him. And of course, she demanded that he teach her how to read. There wasn't a lot of formal education. And she became a reader. And my people were poor. Uh, she moved to, to, to Philadelphia. She had 10 children. She worked as a domestic her whole life. But she made sure all of her children were readers. And my mom was the youngest of her 10 kids. And we grew up poor in a racially segregated community. But she gave us books. My mom went into debt to buy the World Book Encyclopedia so that we could see a world bigger than the world we could see outside our door. Because outside our door, there was outhouses and poverty and people working in poultry factories as if that was the only option. And so I do take from that that there is something powerful in what we can give to one another. And it is rooted in love. And it is rooted in this idea that we can create a better world. And, and that's definitely something. My, I used to ask, my grandmother had 10 kids. I'd say, Mama, why did, you have all, why did you have 10 children? That's a lot of children. And my grandmother would say, um, it's because I had so much love to give. And when you have love, you have to give it. She said, I don't want to leave this place without having given away the love that I have. And, and there's something powerful in that idea, and the people around me who were poor, who were disfavored, who were marginalized, who were excluded, who were often told that they weren't good enough to go through the front door, who had to kind of endure the humiliation of all of that signage and Jim Crow, white and colored, the people around me who had to carry the burden of that still had this amazing capacity to show love to anyone they encountered. Uh, I, you know, my grandmother, I, I like talking about this. When, when integration came to our community, my grandmother started doing this thing where she would come up to me. She had never lived through that. And she was just worried about us. And she started coming up to me. I was like nine. And she'd come up to me and she'd give me these hugs and she'd squeeze me so tightly, I thought she was trying to hurt me. <laughs> and then she'd see me an hour later and she'd say, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? And if I said no, she would jump on me again. <laughs> So, so by the time I was 10, I had learned, every time I saw my grandmother, the first thing I would say is, Mama, I always feel you hugging me. <laughs> and she'd smile the smile, and I didn't appreciate what she was teaching me. And as I said, she, she worked as a domestic her whole life. She lived into her 90s. But when she got in her 90s, she fell one day, and she broke her hip. And then she was diagnosed with cancer. And I was in college at the time, and my grandmother was dying. And I just couldn't imagine being in the world without her. She was just that precious to me. And um, I went to go see her, and they, they told me this would be the last time. And I remember going and sitting next to her bed and holding her hand. Her eyes were closed, and I just started talking. And somehow I got in my head that if I kept talking, she couldn't die. And so I just talked. I talked and talked. And, and finally they came in and said, Brian, you got it. You have to go. And I remember just being just heartbroken. And I stood up to leave. And just as I stood up to leave, I remember my grandmother opening her eyes and then squeezing my hand. And she looked at me. And the last thing she said to me, she said, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? And then she said, I want you to know I'm always going to be hugging you. And I'll be honest, I feel the embrace of the people who came before me. I do. I, I feel like I'm being um, encouraged by people who had to suffer through slavery, who had to endure the humiliation and the violence of lynching, who had to navigate the complexities of segregation. And there is a strength in that. When we opened the National Memorial, the, the space that honors thousands of victims of lynchings, um, I was preoccupied, you know, as a lawyer, you'll identify with this, you know, you want to control everything. You want to make sure everything goes exactly the way you've imagined it. And we were opening these sites and 25,000 people came to Montgomery and I was, you know, trying to manage, manage, manage. And on the morning of the dedication of the memorial, I said, everything's going to be great. It just cannot rain because the memorial is outside and I don't want hundreds of people to get caught. And the clouds were, were, were dark and, and, and ominous. And that morning, I kept thinking, oh, it can't rain, it can't rain. And we had all of these people come inside this memorial outside. And uh, things were going well. I was looking at the sky. And just before I was supposed to get up and speak, right before the end, 
the clouds just opened up and started pouring down raining. And this thing that I had been dreading, it first of all, it just made me feel, ah, oh, this is awful. And I was sitting inside that memorial, looking up at the names of thousands of black people who have been lynched, whose names have never been spoken or acknowledged. And all of a sudden, um, it was like getting one of my grandmother's hugs. All of a sudden, it didn't feel like it was raining on that memorial. All of a sudden, it sounded like all of these people whose lives had been crushed by violence and bigotry, who had been torn away from their families, who had been tortured and killed, all of these people, it sounded like they could finally cry tears of joy because someone was acknowledging the value of their lives, the importance of their witness. And it created a different relationship to that rain. And when we are mindful of all of the forces that have pushed us, who lift us up, I stand on the shoulders of a generation of people who came before me who did so much more with so much less. The people who came before me, they would put on their Sunday best, they'd go places to push for the right to vote, for an end to segregation, they'd be on their knees praying knowing that they were gonna get beaten and battered and bloodied, and they still went. And when you understand that that kind of spirit has given voice to what you're trying to do, it's impossible to become hopeless about your capacity. It's impossible to turn around given all that we have been given. It, it doesn't mean that we don't have to talk about it and think about it and focus. It doesn't mean we don't get overwhelmed, that there won't be tears, that there won't be agony, that there won't be pain because there will. But I feel really fortunate to do what I do, and I do feel lifted up by all of these people who've come before me. I feel embraced uh, by people like my grandmother. And there is an assurance in that that can sustain, and it absolutely energizes me in the work that I do. What about your relationship with Stephen Bright? Can you talk a little bit about, for those that don't know, can you explain yeah. who Stephen is? Yeah, Stephen Bright is, um, was the director of, a, at that time, called the Southern Prisoners Defense Community. It was an organization in Atlanta, Georgia. And, you know, the backstory is, is, you know, I, as a result of integration and lawyers coming into our community to open up the public schools, when I was little, I started my education in a colored school. Lawyers came in, made them open up the public schools, and because of that, I got to go to high school, I got to go to college, loved college, was very engaged with music and, and sports, and I was a philosophy major, and toward the end of my college career, somebody came up to me one day and said, um, you know nobody's gonna pay you to philosophize when you graduate from college. <laughs> and I hadn't really thought about what came after college, and I started looking into graduate programs in history and English and political science, and I realized that to get admitted to those programs, you have to know a lot about history, English, and political science. I was very intimidated by that, so I kept looking. And to be honest, that's how I found my way to law school, because it became clear to me, you don't need to know anything to go to law school. You know? <laughs> and so uh, I signed up there, but I was very disillusioned at, at Harvard Law School, because it didn't seem like anybody was talking about race or, or the poor, or social inequality. And I, I left after my first year, I went over to the School of Government to get a degree in public policy, and I didn't feel good about that. It seemed like they were teaching us to maximize benefits and minimize costs, but it didn't matter whose benefits got maximized and whose costs got minimized. And I went back, and I was really having an existential crisis, uh, and I took a course that required me to spend a month in Atlanta, Georgia, working with these human rights lawyers, and uh, Steve Bright, who was the director of that organization, met me in North Carolina, and we flew from North Carolina to Atlanta, and he modeled, along with the other lawyers there, a different kind of lawyering. These were lawyers that got up early in the morning. They worked hard all day. You could tell their lives were animated by the work they were doing. And that just showed me that it was possible to integrate everything that I was feeling in my heart and everything I was pushing me uh, from my history with the practice of law. And, uh, you know, Steve modeled for me this idea that you create justice in the world not by the ideas in your mind, but by the conviction in your heart. And uh, I graduated and I went to work with him. You know, I was making $14,000 a year. Uh, I couldn't afford a place to stay. Um, Steve let me sleep on his couch uh, and 
for like, I think he thought I was going to be there like a few weeks. I was there a year and a half. Um, but he saw that as part of what had to be done to meet the needs of people on death row who were literally dying for legal assistance. The needs were so overwhelming. This was in the 80s where you know, we would get calls on a Tuesday about somebody who had an execution date on a Friday, and we'd have to intervene, and we'd go running. And, and, um, and we just believed that we had to do whatever it took. And I think Steve and, and SPDC modeled something that became um, what I've tried to do, which is a law practice that is client-centered, where, where you prioritize the needs of the people you represent over your own needs, because basically the people you represent are so much more vulnerable than you're going to be. So yes, it would be nicer to live here and have this and do this, but if that's going to block you from doing the things you need to do, then you, you need to do these things. And it was a really important really necessary lesson, and I'm grateful to him. And the community of people around him who also had that spirit of service, um, uh, which I think is so essential if we're going to actually advance justice. And you know, as you were talking, um, all these things, you know, getting up early in the morning and working and doing for our, for our clients and, uh, you know, really wanting sometimes, for me, to have the temerity to try to fix them somehow or, or make their problems go away. How, how do you not despair? And I ask this question for myself. Yeah. How do you not despair in front of doing and doing and doing and then hearing that someone is going to be executed? You know, I think it's, I, I think it's better to prepare yourself for moments of despair than to try to function in a way where there will never be despair. You know, um, when we first opened our office in the late 80s, I got a call from someone who was scheduled to be executed. We hadn't even received like books and computers yet. It was literally the first day the phones worked. And this man said, uh, Mr. Stevenson, I'm scheduled to be executed in 30 days. Will you please take my case? And I said, look, I'm sorry, but I can't take any cases. I don't have staff, I don't have books, I don't have anything. I don't think I can help you yet. And he didn't even say anything, he just hung up. And it unnerved me, and I didn't sleep that night. And I came back the next day, and he called me again. He said, Mr. Stevenson, I know you don't have your books, I know you don't have your computers, I know you don't have your staff. He said, but please take my case. He said, you don't have to tell me you can win. You don't have to tell me you can get a stay of execution. He said, but I don't think I can make it these next 29 days if there's no hope at all. And so I said yes, because I couldn't, I didn't have the capacity to say no. And we tried really hard to get a stay of execution, but every court we went to said too late. And one of the problems with our legal system, even now, is that we have a legal system that is more committed to finality than to fairness. And so every court said too late, too late. All of these issues should have been presented. And on the day of the execution, I found myself uh, going down to Atmore, Alabama to be with this man. This is when they executed people by electrocution. And when I got there, they shaved the hair off of his body, which was one of the most brutally humiliating things I've ever seen happen to a human being. And we started talking. And it was really emotional, and it was really intense, and we were praying, we were holding hands, and all of this. And then he said to me, he said, Brian, it's been so strange. He said, all day long, people have been saying, what can I do to help you? When I woke up this morning, the guard said, what can we get you for breakfast? Then they said, what can we get you for lunch? What can we get you for dinner? All day long, people have been saying, how can I help you? Do you want stamps for your letters? Do you want coffee? Do you want water? And then he looked at me and he said, Brian, it's been so strange. He said, more people have said, what can I do to help you in the last 14 hours of my life than they ever did in the first 19 years of my life. And I was thinking, yeah, where were they when your mom died when you were three? Where were they when you were abused at seven? Where were they when you were dealing with the drugs? Uh, where were they when you came back from Vietnam traumatized? And with those kinds of questions in my mind, they pulled this man away, strapped him uh, into the electric chair, and executed him. And there was a part of me that didn't think I could ever recover from that. 
But there was another part of me that understood how important it was to have fought for this man, to have made the argument that his life has value, that his life has purpose, that he is not beyond hope, he is not beyond redemption. And to put that in the world, to put that in the record before someone executed him. And I think about him, I talk about him a lot, and um, that experience has pushed me to find and to fight. And that's the thing about despair. It's sometimes when we are overwhelmed with the weight of a problem, that we begin to think differently about what we're going to do to deconstruct this problem. It's, that's the process that gives rise um, to innovation, uh, to new strategies, to new solutions. And I just think we have to prepare ourselves for that. I'm, I've been doing this a long time. Uh, I know that there will still be times, there will be days when I'm gonna be overwhelmed, I'm gonna see something painful that breaks my heart. But I've gotten this consciousness that tells me that if we persevere, if we push on, maybe we'll get on the other side of that. And I think about that in relation you know, to the people I represent. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna talk about Joe because he's here. When I, you know, uh, first time I met Joe was at a Florida prison where they did um, not treat people well and they moved him to the visitation room and they put him in a little cell, he's in a wheelchair, and they put him in a little cell and they couldn't get him out. And what they did was just painful to witness. And I didn't think um, we'd get past that. And then we started talking and I realized that he was a poet and he was someone who had this amazing laugh. And there was nothing I wanted to do more than to get Joe Sullivan out of prison because I knew he did not belong there. And we kept fighting. Every court we went to in Florida said denied. Every court we went to said denied. And eventually the United States Supreme Court granted cert. And I remember being in front of the United States Supreme Court arguing that it is cruel to say to any child of 13 that you are only fit to die in prison. And I was thinking about Joe Sullivan. And then I remember saying how unusual it is that we shield children from drugs and alcohol. We don't let them do all of these things, but we're willing to put 13 and 14 year old children in adult prisons and condemn to die. And I don't think it's possible without that kind of despair that pushes you. And ultimately, uh, we won that case. And that's why it's so precious, even magical, to be on this stage talking to you here in New York City and to have him sitting a few feet away. And that's what happens. <laughs> but, but I say that as just a testament to what happens when you push through despair. When you push through everybody saying no. When you hear people keep saying sit down and you still stand up. When you hear people keep saying, be quiet and you still speak. And it is exhausting. Uh, but I am now really privileged because I've been doing this long enough to see the fruits of that, to know that, um, uh, that truth crushed to earth will rise again. I don't think that what we have seen is what we will continue to see forever. And that is the, that is the hope, that is the faith. And uh, I get encouraged along the way when things turn out the right way. But I think you have to prepare yourself for moments of desperation and despair. And I tell everybody who comes to my office, there are gonna be some days when there's gonna be tears. This is not a tear-free life. And I think sometimes when you understand that, you navigate those moments differently uh, with a conviction that they do not end your effort. They're just a part of your effort. I, um, I'd like to um, talk about this whole idea of, um, you know, the, the, we need criminal justice reform, uh, systemic racism in society, um, all of these seemingly insurmountable big problems 
but yet I'm standing here, sitting here in front of you um, with Joe there, and there's a relationship there, and all. Um, it's about a person, uh, a man with a name, first and last. Um, how, how can we educate young people, and not so young people, not to, not to allow um, the circumstances that continue to exist with uh, you know, racial bias and injustice? Um, you know, and I can name names as far as what's been going on in the news the Black Lives Matter movement that uh, has arisen around all of this, and the real, real problem of, um, of police brutality. I, I see it. Um, unfortunately, sometimes I see it um, on videos as part of evidence. Um, but how, how, can, how can we educate an entire society? Uh, can we change the society collectively? What, is that even possible? Does the question make sense? Yeah, it does. And I absolutely think it's possible. I mean, in many ways, the existence of the museum and memorial we created is a testament to some progress because um, I, you know, I didn't have the capacity, the ability to even imagine something like that at the start of my career. We can do something like that. Now, and when you look at what we've done on other issues, I am persuaded that we can do better here. Uh, there was a time in this country where we did not think domestic abuse was a big deal. We would not arrest people who were engaged in domestic violence. And women would be calling the police and police would show up. They're not gonna arrest the man for that abuse. There was this false idea that if you married someone, somehow you're just stuck with whatever you experience. And we started working on the narrative and we started telling stories. We gave names to the victims of that abuse. There was a film, A Burning Bed, Farrah Fawcett. And it was just a way of naming and dramatizing the experience of that. And the narratives began to shift. And now we're in a very different place. We still have a lot of work to do, but we're in a very different place. We tolerated uh, drunk driving for a long time. In my lifetime, when I was a teenager, there were no severe penalties for people who got in cars intoxicated. And so many children were being killed on roadways by intoxicated drivers. And then this group, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, began naming their children. And they got resources and they started doing campaigning and, and commercials. And it changed the comfort of policymakers with that issue. And we began to think differently about the consequences of that. And today, the legal landscape has shifted entirely when it comes to that issue. And you see that in a lot of areas. We just haven't made that kind of effort when it comes to race. And we've allowed false narratives to create this world that we're now dealing with in our, in our criminal legal system. I mean, the false narrative, which was rooted in what I call the politics of fear and anger, is that we had politicians saying that people who are drug addicted and drug dependent are criminals, and we're gonna use the criminal justice system to deal with them. When in fact, people who are drug addicted uh, or are drug dependent have a health problem, and we really need to be using the healthcare system to respond to that. But when people are being governed by fear and anger, they will tolerate things that they're not, they shouldn't tolerate. They'll accept things that they wouldn't otherwise accept, and that's what has been behind this punitive era in American society. And politicians were literally competing with each other over who could be the most punitive. Three strikes, you're out. Life without parole for this, life without. I represent people who are serving life without parole sentences for writing a bad check for under $100 because of felony, habitual felony offender laws. And we had this false idea come into our policy making that we could put crimes in prison, and that's the way legislators and policymakers debate them. Oh, that crime, I hate that crime. Let's put that in prison for 50 years. Oh, I hate that crime even more. Let's put that in 100 years. And we allow these policymakers to function as if you can put crimes in prison, and you cannot put a crime in prison. You can only put a person in prison, and people are not crimes. And that reality got lost, and so part of what has to change is we have to get people to understand that there are people behind these behaviors. And so, yes, I absolutely believe it can shift. Look, we're, this is, we have still been a country, and it's only since the 1970s that the prison population started to escalate. Throughout most of the 20th century, it was relatively stable. And while it's gone on for 50 years, most of American history, um, we have not had 
you know, hundreds of thousands of people in our prisons with these kinds of long-term sentences. But it will take a lot of effort to kind of change that. Uh, and that's why I think it is important to engage people in this broader conversation about what does doing justice require? What does loving mercy require? What does a relationship with uh, people who you care about require? But I'm absolutely persuaded. We could actually reduce the prison population today by half, and it would have no adverse impact on public safety. I'm very, very confident about that. We could let half the people in our jails and prisons out, and it would not have any adverse impact on public safety. We just have to find the will to understand that being the country with the highest rate of incarceration in the world is nothing we should be proud of. That indicts our commitment to democracy and justice. It is a stain. It is a blur on our human rights identity. And if we're going to make progress in the world, then we're going to have to deal with that. In your work, you, um, you come across a lot of young people. And I heard you say once that um, you go to these communities that are very poor um, and very segregated. And you talk to young men who tell you that their expectation is that they're going to go to prison someday. Um, talk to me about what we can do to educate those young men and women um, that are hopeless because you have hope. How, how, can, how can we as a society assist um, and facilitate the possibility for a young man not to believe that he's just part of a system that's gonna send him to prison? Well, I, I think it's a threefold problem. I think, first of all, everybody else in society has to care more about the plight of people who are marginalized and excluded. So when the Bureau of Justice projected in 2001 that one in three black male babies born in this country is expected to go to jail or prison. One in six Hispanic boys is expected to go to jail or prison. Um, that was shocking, but what was more shocking was the collective silence that surrounded that. There were no convenings. There were no pandemic-like interventions. We did not talk about what we're going to have to do to prevent this horrible thing from happening. We just sort of accepted it. And that tolerance is part of the problem. So I want to say to the rest of society that we do not show our commitment to children by looking at how well we treat talented kids and gifted kids and privileged kids. If we really want to know how we're treating our children, if we want to know what we're doing for children, we have to look at how we're treating poor kids, neglected kids, abused kids, kids in detention facilities. That's where you understand a society's commitment to its children. The second thing is that we have to deal with this epidemic of trauma uh, because that's behind a lot of these really problematic uh, outcomes. And the truth is, we've got zip codes all over America where 60, 70, 80% of the kids are going to end up in some kind of system because they're living in spaces where too many are born into violent families, they live in violent neighborhoods, people are always shouting, there's too much gun violence, there's too much domestic violence, there's too much police violence. And when you're surrounded by that, you, you, you develop a trauma disorder. Just like our combat veterans, when you go abroad, if somebody came in here and threatened to kill all of us, each of us would start producing cortisol and adrenaline because that's how we cope with threat. And if that threat were eliminated, some of us would get back to normal in a couple of hours. Some of us, it would take a couple of days. For some of us, it might take weeks, depending on our prior exposure. And what happens when you're constantly being threatened, like our, our soldiers, the brain just starts producing those chemicals all the time. And even when you're not being threatened, you're in this hyper-reactive state, this hyper kind of vigilant state. And that's what the problem is when our veterans come home. And the way you treat that is you try to create an environment where someone feels safe, and you make them feel safe long enough that the brain starts producing those chemicals. Well, we've got children in this country born into these violent spaces, and by the time they're four or five, they're in that traumatized state. We send them to schools. Uh, we have teachers in the schools that talk to these young people like the teachers are correctional officers. We have principals that run the schools like they're prison wardens. 
We threaten them with expulsion and we threaten them with suspension. We threaten and threaten and threaten. And when you're dealing with a trauma disorder, that just aggravates the conditions that you are dealing with. And so when you get to be eight and somebody gives you a drug for the first time and says, hey, take this, we know what you're going through and you'll have a few hours where you don't feel threatened and menaced. You take the drug and what do you want? You want more of the drug. Or when somebody comes along in your tent and says, I know exactly what you're feeling, that's why we have this gang and we'll help you fight against the things, you join the gang. And so we have to understand the, the sociological and the psychological conditions that are pushing these young kids to think what they think. And then lastly, I want to say to the kids, is that you are strong enough, you are talented enough, you are beautiful enough that despite all of these things, despite the indifference of the larger society, despite all of these threats, I mean, you can still find a way. And we want to educate them about the people that came before them. We have a calendar that talks about the history of struggle. And I give that to my young clients because I want them to understand that however hard and difficult things seem for them, they are not the first people in this country to have looked at a world where there was nothing but hardship. And I talk about my enslaved great-grandparents. I talk about people who had to flee the land because of lynching and violence. I talk about the degradation of segregation. And I want them to understand that they have more power than others think they have. And when you find your power, when you find your voice, when you find your poetry, then you can survive, then you can overcome then you can navigate things that people didn't think you could navigate. You need help along the way, which is why we have to all wrap our arms around people like that. But for me, it's about saying to those young people, you have capacity to do things that others don't think, but it's also about saying to the rest of society that this is your problem too, that you have to be engaged in creating a society where all children have the opportunity to be healthy and to live and to thirst, and then, we need to stop spending billions of dollars to put people in jails and prisons and start spending money on creating a kind of intervention that helps us deal with the challenges of trauma and mental illness and poverty and despair that is so epidemic in too many communities in this country. You know, you're, uh, I guess, one of the most famous quotes, and if you Google Brian Stevenson quotes, they come up. <laughs> um, but um, each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. Um, what is that more in each of us that makes you be able to say that statement? Well, I just think that um, every person has the capacity uh, to move toward redemption, I believe that. Every person has the capacity to move toward love. Um, I've represented a lot of people. I've never represented anybody who just wanted to be in prison, who just wanted uh, to commit crime. I've never represented anybody like that. And um, for me, it's not really hard to see the other things you are, right? The other things that people are. What's hard is when we judge people so harshly that we don't allow them to be anything else uh, than the label we give them. One of my big pet peeves, and sorry to go off on this tangent, but I just wrote a letter about this, is newspapers do this all the time. You know, when they report on people um, who are in the criminal legal system, they'll actually use labels like convicted killer, convicted rapist, or rapist, or burglar, or gang leader, as if that identity describes entirely who that person is. And the problem is, of course, they don't do that for, for people with status. If a police officer is accused of crime, they get to stay a police officer even while they're being prosecuted. If somebody with means is accused of something, they keep their identity. We will make people learn their names, but these other folks. And that kind of labeling creates this kind of notion that these people, and when you read in the newspaper that juvenile killers are trying to get out of prison, it creates rage and resistance. And so I have to keep preaching that we are all more than the worst thing we've ever done. And I don't think it's something I want people to hear as me talking just about my clients. I want them to hear it for themselves too. I believe everybody here is more than the worst thing we've ever done. I think if somebody here has told a lie, it would be tragic if they could forever only be known as a liar. 
Most people have told lies, and it would be tragic if we take, took away from them the opportunity to be anything other than a liar. I think if someone takes something that doesn't belong to them, they're not just a thief. I think even if you kill someone, you're not just a killer. And I believe that because that's what my lived experience in jails and prisons over 30 some years has taught me. But beyond that, it's what my lived experience with human beings in a variety of settings have taught me. Even the people who have engaged in horrific bigotry, that judge I mentioned, it's so interesting. When we opened the sites, we got a lot of people visiting. And uh, people now come to Montgomery and they go to the sites and a lot of them have read the book and they come to the office and they were like, I wanna talk to Brian Stevenson. And we've had, it's wonderful, but I can't come and talk to all of them. We've had like thousands of people coming. And so my, my receptionist is very skilled at saying, yes, no, I appreciate that, but I doubt that. And one day this man came and he was saying, uh, I wanna talk to Brian Stevenson. And she gave him the same rap and uh, he just started crying in the lobby, middle-aged white guy. And he just started doing all of these things. And my assistant finally said, Brian, I don't know what to do. This, this guy down here, and he's just saying he has to talk to you. And so I said, all right. This is not something I'm encouraging anybody else to do. <laughs> the, the point of this story is not that this is the recipe, not that you would. Uh, but I, I went down into the lobby, and uh, this man ran over to me and gave me this hug, and I could tell he was crying, and he just started saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Didn't know who he was. And I stepped back, and that's when I recognized him. It was the judge that got mad at me for being in the courtroom uh, a few years earlier. He says, I treated you unfairly. What I did was wrong. It was racist. I realize it, and I'm just so sorry. And what's interesting to me about that is um, I like people to know that even when we engage in acts that are bigoted and violent and destructive, we have the capacity to get past that. You know, we have a horrible history in this country, but I'm not afraid to talk about this history because I also believe that we can be something better. I think there is something better waiting for us in America, I do. There's something that feels more like freedom, feels more like equality, feels more like justice, and it's waiting for us. But for us to get there, we have to acknowledge when we make mistakes. We have to learn how to say, I'm sorry. Our culture does not like, I'm sorry. And our systems really don't like, I'm sorry. They hate saying, I'm sorry. They fight against it. Our politicians don't like saying, I'm sorry. They think it makes them look weak, and I think it is an obstacle to becoming strong. I'm sorry is the way. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I say this because I really believe it, because if we want to build lasting and enduring, loving relationships, we have to be willing to acknowledge when we make mistakes. You show me two people who've been in love for 50 years, and I'll show you two people who learned how to apologize when they offend one another. And it doesn't make them weak, it makes them strong. And that's why I keep saying we're more than the worst things that we've ever done, because if we create a society where you are only defined, you are reduced to your worst act, and you can never escape that, we create a society that is hopeless. And hopelessness is the enemy of justice. And justice will prevail where hopelessness persists. And so if we want justice, and if we want to evolve, if we want to get to a better place, we have to embrace this notion that we're all more than our worst act speak a little bit just we're we're almost at time but um you said something about your own brokenness that really moved me because I think about my own every day it's what gets me out of bed in the morning to yeah. go to court and deal with watching the chain gangs of yeah. mostly black men yeah. you know walking like penguins into my courtroom and it's just it's I'm never going to get used to that and the day that I do I, I I'll stop doing yeah. what I do yeah. Um, talk to me about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have kind of created a new relationship to the work that I do, and it, and it began when I was working on a case where, again, I got a call from somebody who had an execution date in 30 days, and the person had already been through the appeals process and knew it would be very hard to get a stay of execution. Uh, I did discover that he was intellectually disabled, and our courts have banned the execution of people with intellectual disability. So I went to the court, said, you can't execute this man, he's intellectually disabled. Every court said, too late, too late. And I once again found myself 
waiting for a ruling on the day of the scheduled execution and uh, about 45 minutes before the execution was supposed to happen, the court called and basically said our motion for a stay had been denied. And the hardest thing I have to do is to talk to someone on death row and say what I said to this person. I had to say, I'm so sorry, um, but I can't stop this execution. And this young man, he did what I dread the most when I'm in that situation. He just began to cry. And before I, I, I could say anything, he was sobbing on the other end of the phone. And um, then he said, Mr. Stevenson, please don't hang up. There's something really important I have to say to you. And I said, of course. And then he tried to say something to me, but he couldn't get his words out. And uh, in addition to being intellectually disabled, he had a speech impediment. When he got really nervous and stressed, he would begin to stutter. And he could not get out a single word. And he kept trying to say something to me, but he couldn't get his words out. And he kept trying, and he kept trying, and he kept trying. And the more he tried to speak and failed, the more he was just ripping my heart apart. I already felt crushed that we couldn't stop the execution, but the next thing I knew, I was holding the phone, tears were running down my face, and it was so overwhelming that my mind actually wandered, and I remembered how when I was a little boy, my mom had taken me to church one Sunday, and I was talking to my friends, and this little kid uh, I'd never seen before was standing there, and I turned to this little boy, I said, hey man, what's your name? And this little boy also had a speech impediment, and he couldn't get his words out, and so he stuttered, and when he couldn't get his words out right, I remember doing something really ignorant, I laughed. And my mom saw me laughing at this little boy and she gave me this look I'd never seen before. And she came over and she grabbed me by the arm, she pulled me aside, she said, Brian, don't you ever laugh at somebody because they can't get their words out right. And I was like 10, I was still a little bit of a lawyer and so I was like, well mom, I couldn't hear, I couldn't see, the lights were low, I didn't know what was going on, I wasn't really like. And she said, no, Brian, you know better than that. And she said, now I want you to go back over there and tell that little boy you're sorry. And I said, okay, mom. And I took a step and then she grabbed me by the arm. She said, wait, after you tell that little boy you're sorry, I want you to hug that little boy. And I sort of rolled my eyes. I said, okay, mom. And I took a step and then she grabbed me by the arm again. She said, wait, after you tell that little boy you're sorry, after you hug that little boy, I want you to tell that little boy you love him. I said, Mom, I can't go over there and tell that little boy I love him. <laughs> she gave me that look, and so I remember going over to this little boy and walking up to him and saying, look, man, you know, well, you know, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then I sort of lunged at him and gave him my little boy version of a man hug. And then I remember trying to say as insincerely as I possibly could, I said, look, man, you know, well, you know, um, well, um, I love you. <laughs> and what I'd forgotten until the night of that execution is how that little boy hugged me back and then he whispered flawlessly in my ear and he said, I love you too. And I was thinking about that and then finally my client got his words out and he said, um, Mrs. Stevenson, I, I just wanna thank you for representing me. And then he said, I wanna thank you for fighting for me. And the last thing this man said before they executed him, he said, Mr. Stevenson, I want you to know that I love you for trying to save my life. They pulled him away, they strapped him to a gurney, and they executed him. And when I hung up the phone, I just said, I can't do this anymore. It was just too much, too much. I was thinking about how broken he was. And I started reflecting on the fact that all of my clients are broken, I represent broken people, broken by poverty, broken by neglect, broken by abuse, broken by addiction, broken by trauma, that I realize that I work in a broken system because the people who have the power are unwilling to do the things that need to be done to create healing and justice and redemption. And in that moment, I just said, I can't do this anymore. And I remember sitting down thinking about that and uh, something said, you better think about why you do. If you're not going to do this work anymore, you need to think about why you do what you do. And I started thinking about it. And that's when I realized something I hadn't really realized before. And what I realized that night is that I don't do what I do because I've been trained as a lawyer. I don't do what I do because somebody has to do it. I don't do what I do because if I don't do it, no one will. What I realized that night that I'd never really realized before is that I do what I do because I'm broken too. And the truth is, there is a community of broken people 
And we know something about what it means to be fully human. And what it persuades me is that you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be flawless. You don't have to have an unblemished record. You don't have to be this or that. You just have to have this belief that even in struggle, you can say something. And those are the people who have persuaded me. So I can't stop doing what I'm doing because I am part of a community of people who understand the need for justice, the urgency of justice, the power of justice. And I don't run from the moments that shake me, that kind of cause me to reflect on that. And, um, you know, it's when we're broken that we sometimes understand what grace feels like, what redemption feels like, what healing feels like. And uh, I, I'm, I'm saying more and more that I'm, I'm feeling hopeful and determined and energetic because I now know uh, I'm living by grace. I'm living with injuries, uh, but those injuries are incapable of keeping me from something better. When I was a little boy, I used to play in a church and the people who had the hardest, most painful testimonies would always end their testimonies and they'd start singing this song. They'd say, I wouldn't take nothing from my journey now. And that's what I feel like singing almost every day. It wouldn't take nothing from my journey now. One final word, just like um, the Equal Justice Initiative runs on individual donors and help, not big corporations, uh, the uh, New York Encounter also <laughs> needs donations. So don't forget to go to the website or donate at any one of the QR codes. Thank you. Thank you so much. In a few minutes at the second floor auditorium, Immunity, COVID-19 and Beyond, a presentation on how our immune system responds to viruses and vaccines with Mark Painter, postdoctoral doctoral fellow, University of Pennsylvania. If you could give me one minute and I'll get through all of these announcements. And after that, here at 4 p.m., Body and Identity, a presentation on gender theory and its social implications with Abigail Favale, Dean of the College of Humanities, George Fox University, and Helen Joyce, Executive Editor for Events Business of the Economist. At 5.30 p.m., the final presentation, What Never Dies. You are not going to want to miss this. This is going to be amazing. The life of Dr. Tagashi Nagai and his wife Midori with Gabriella Di Comite, President of the Friends of Tagashi and Midori Nagai Association, Chad Deal, historian and instructional designer at the University of Virginia, and Dominic Higgins, movie director. And then, as every year at 7.30, this urge for singing, final night of celebration and songs with the Encounter volunteers. Thank you.
at 4 p.m. Body and Identity, a presentation on gender theory and its social implications with Abigail Faval and Helen Joyce, Main Floor Auditorium.
please be seated for body and identity. In five minutes, please be seated.
Please take your seats as the event is about to begin.
Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this beautiful event here in uh, the Metropolitan Pavilion. My name is Holly Peterson, and I'm really graced to be with these two beautiful women today to share their story and a little bit about body and identity. So first, I'm going to introduce to you our um, remote guest, who is Helen Joyce. Helen Joyce is in Cambridge, England right now. Um, she's the author of Trans, which is a book um, published in 2021. And in 2005, she joined The Economist, where she works presently. Um, she's their British editor, but she's also been their editor in Sao Paulo, Brazil, an international editor, finance editor, executive editor for events, etc. Previously, she's also published in um, a journal called PLUS for the University of Cambridge and was the founding editor of the Royal Statistical Society's magazine, Significance. So as I said, Helen joins us from Cambridge, where she resides with her husband and two children. And I also have here Abigail Favela. Abigail, you got fans out there, Abigail. <laughs> Abigail is the Dean of Humanities with, at George Fox University, where she also teaches seminar in theology, philosophy, and literature. Her award-winning writing has appeared in The Atlantic, First Things, Church Life, and other literary and academic journals. Her memoir, Into the Deep, for sale outside, um, was published in 2018. Her academic background is in both feminist and gender theory, and her latest book, The Genesis of Gender, A Christian Theory, will be released by Ignatius Press in about a month or so. Abigail lives in Oregon with her husband and four children. So welcome to both of our guests today. So first question um, is for you, Abigail. So let's just start off with some very basic information about what we're gonna be discussing this afternoon. So gender theory, can you help us understand what it is, a bit about the history of gender theory, and can we also help us understand what is meant when we say sex and when we say gender? All right, well, that's not a simple question, right? What is gender? I think that's the question of the moment. And it's difficult to answer because depending on who you ask and maybe what time of day you ask, you'll get different answers. Um, so there are a lot of different definitions of gender that are on offer right now. And so one of the difficulties of talking about this tricky topic is that people will be using the, the word sex and gender but meaning very different things and sometimes even mutually exclusive things by them. So uh, what might be helpful would be to give just like a quick and dirty historical overview of how the concept of gender developed in the 20th century. So I'll hit some of the highlights or lowlights, depending on how you look at it. Um, and then we'll see if that, I'm, a I'm afraid I'll probably add to the confusion, but I think we just have to wade into it. Okay. So I'll start with uh, feminist philosopher Simone de Beauvoir, who wrote um, the Second Sex, which was published in 1949. And the most famous line from that, from that book is, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman, right? And so that, that statement really is the, the seed of gender theory. And what Simone de Beauvoir is saying in that um, statement is she's making a distinction between woman and female. So she's saying there is this biological facticity of femaleness, but then there are all kinds of social and cultural interpretations of what human femaleness should look like that are layered onto it and that she, she calls woman. So what's interesting, however, is that she doesn't use the, the word gender. You'll notice it's called the second sex. It's not called the second gender. And that's because the word gender was not used in this context yet. And it did not enter the scene until um, John Money, psychologist John Money, began using it in the, the 1950s. Um, and he was the, the first person to coin the term gender role, for example, which has now become so common. Um, and he had a theory of, of pretty extreme social constructionism. So he thought that there's biological sex, but then gender or one's social role and um, that the social expressions and role of one's sex were completely socially constructed and socially shaped and completely malleable, at least in the first three year, years of life or so. 
And he was the first one to really introduce this idea of gender as something distinct from sex. And he had the, unfortunately, he actually had the opportunity to, to test his theory um, on two twin boys, one of whom was, um, had a botched circumcision as an infant, and so his, his genitalia was basically um, obliterated. And so his parents brought the twins to John Money to say, well, what do we do? And he's like, don't worry about it. You know, sex really doesn't matter. Um, we'll just kind of, you know, shape this kid up, raise him as a girl, it'll be fine. He won't even know the difference because gender identity is, is a complete construct. So um, this experiment failed pretty catastrophically. So um, the boy eventually rejected his imposed identity as Brenda um, and then tried to, to eke out a normal life as an adult before he, he killed himself in 2004, actually two years after his twin brother as well committed suicide. So both subjects in this, in this experiment um, died. But unfortunately, it, that tragedy took decades to play out. So in the interim, and especially in the first decade or so, um, af as he began this experiment, he was publishing widely a about gender being this success. And so the concept of gender then took hold in the humanities and social sciences, and feminist theory particularly. So it comes from money, and then second wave feminists take this concept of gender as a way of critiquing the ways in which um, women have been, or that womanhood has been expressed culturally and socially, right? So that's when you get the classic second wave feminist split between sex and gender. Sex is biology, and then gender as, again, the kind of cultural and social meanings imposed on biology. So the next important part of the story would be um, Judith Butler, who, who begins writing in the, in the 1980s. And it's, it's difficult to overestimate the influence of, of Butler's theories in this, con in this discussion about gender. So we already had this idea, very common, very taken kind of as dogma, that you have sex and then you have gender. So gender is a social construct, sex is biological. Well, Butler was the first person to actually come out and say, well, yes, gender is a social construct, and sex is too, right? So Butler's coming from a, a perspective of anti-realist postmodern philosophy, right? So she, her work is heavily influenced by um, Foucault, Michel Foucault. So for Butler, there is no such thing as reality. Any, t any truth claims we make, anything we describe as real, is ultimately um, not only a construct, but it's a, it's, a, it's a social power move, right? So any categorizations that we make, anything that we say is real, any claims of knowledge, those are ultimately exercises of power. And for, for Butler, her whole goal as a theorist was not to reassert some other version of the real, but to question the idea of the real itself and to be just this perennial gadfly, um, to basically poke at categories, reveal exceptions, and just kind of dismantle norms and categories. And so then from the influence of her work is where I think we began to get this latest iteration of what gender is, even though I think it actually contradicts what but Lyrian philosophy looks like, because now um, we're in a cultural moment where the, the reality of sex is denied, like sex is kind of seen as a construct, right? But then gender has become almost this sex of the soul or the psyche um, that, that is asserted as something real, right? So that gives you a little bit of a sense of, of kind of a, how the concept of gender has changed over time, and also how relatively young a history that it has, you know, this, this word and this idea. But I think because it's not attached to any kind of material reality, it's like this, it's like this postmodern juggernaut that can really take on almost any kind of meaning that you want to ascribe to it. We'll come back to the question of what reality and what is real and what is not real in this question, but I wanted to ask you one more before I um, go to Helen. And that is this, you mentioned um, in one of your talks that there's a reification happening today, and um, you define that as a sense of making real something that's not real. So yeah. in this issue, what does that look like? Okay, so that's, yes. So that's actually kind of what I was just describing in a way. So 
we get this idea that gender and sex are both social constructs, that they aren't real from Judith Butler, from philosophy that's very anti-realist at its foundation. But the problem is, like, human beings don't think that way, right? I mean, that's what this whole encounter is about, like the urge for truth. Like, human beings are always going to reach for what is real. They're going to reach for what is true. And so I think the way that Butler's theories have trickled down through the academy and through the education system, through pop culture, social media, you have now, um, I think, especially a lot of young people who are kind of seizing on to the freedom that this idea of sex and gender being a social construct, like that's pretty freeing, but then there's this pivot that happens, and then the new categories of what sex and gender are are very much asserted as real, you know? So I think if you, you know, say the, the average teenager who's you know, coming out as trans, like, they're probably not thinking there is no such thing as reality, and so I can play with all these categories. Like, they, they are seizing onto this concept in order to express something that they believe to be very real. So I think that's what I mean by this, this reification turn that I think is happening on that level, but I think there's also a way in which activists are um, aware of the fact that they're making linguistic assertions in order to reshape our understanding of reality. So they're, they're maybe a little more consciously doing kind of the Butlerian thing. Um, but so I think both of those things are then making or reifying, making real what is, what is fundamentally based on a denial of reality. Thank you. Yeah. So Helen, um, welcome Helen. And I want to ask you more or less the same question. If um, you've often noted in your writing that there is a huge detachment of language from reality. So when you think about this and reification is, as Helen, or sorry, as Abigail just said, what, what do you have to say on that topic more than she's already said? I thought it was an absolutely fascinating, uh, incredibly um, brief but comprehensive trot through uh, <laughs> an ex incredible history. I suppose the things that I'd pick out were, are that um, I, would, I would say more about the distinction between what's happening in universities and what's happening in schools and on Tumblr and on social media. It's exactly as Abigail said that what's feeding through into the popular culture isn't this rather sophisticated, I mean, in my opinion, completely fallacious, but at least it's sophisticated theory about everything being socially constructed and gender is, I think, a... Um, an imitation without an original was what yeah. Judith Butler said. So yeah. it's entirely this self-perpetuating thing that didn't start anywhere and that we can shape and we can play with. And I mean, why bother, I want to ask, but at least that's a sophisticated sort of thought. But what's happening on Tumblr or in schools is people are saying you have something like a sexed soul. And that sexed soul is real, but your body is what I've heard called meat Lego. It's a thing that... You can chop bits off, you can sew other bits on, you can change it. Um, you are something like um, a homunculus living behind the eyes of some meat robot. And, and the real thing is the thing in here. And unfortunately, we feed this by the way that we have moved into a very virtual world. I mean, in some ways, it's great. Here I am in Cambridge, England, chatting to you lovely ladies, and I wish I was with you. But since I can't be, at least this is second best. But then the kids are sitting in front of screens all the time and they're changing their avatars and, you know, playing with being male, female, as you know, an animal, um, you know, 10 foot tall, two foot tall, whatever. And that feels real to them. It feels real to all of us increasingly. So they're forgetting what their bodies are and the fact that they were, they were created, they were, you know, born, they were, they were inside their mothers for nine months and, and then brought into the world and that they will live and they will die and they will live in only one body this is the only one body that they have and that body has been completely sidelined it's been turned into words and that is about power because the belief the postmodern belief the postmodern turn as they call it is that words create reality mm -hmm. and of course words do to some extent create reality when you say i thee wed you turn two people into a legal couple you've just performed words that have created some reality but there's something bedrock beneath the words that we use. But that's been erased and now the words are everything. The words create reality and that's a power play. So you must alter the words if you want to alter reality. And then the final thing I'd say about that is people may wonder why the viciousness and the vitriol that is poured upon anyone who disagrees with the modern way of looking at things. And it's because the words make reality. Mm -hmm. So when you yeah. silence people, 
you are stopping them from doing the only harm that's possible, namely by naming what they see and bringing into existence a reality that the activists don't want to see. And so it's an extraordinary maneuver. It's taken some decades, but we've arrived at an, a really strange place where words are real, bodies aren't real, um, where you know words are violence, but actual violence is just standing up for oppression or the oppressed people. It, it's, it's, it's just surreal. Yeah, thank you. On that same note, I wanted to... Go ahead. <laughs> You begin in the book Trans, you begin by saying this is a book about an idea, one that is simple but has far-reaching consequences. So my question for you, Helen, is this a cultural phenomenon we're entering into? I mean, I see it as an American um, movement that's something like a neo-religion. Um, you know, it's maybe not apparent to people in America how much this is something that's come out of American campuses in particular. And it's been exported around the world and it arrives at places that are culturally closest to America first. So here in Britain, uh, we're experiencing it in Canada, they are Australia, New Zealand, much less so on continental Europe, hardly anywhere, anywhere else. Um, it's the idea is this sort of seemingly simple idea that what makes you a man or a woman, or indeed a boy or a girl, is what you say you are. It's what you say you feel and what you state that you feel. It's not your body. It's not that you were conceived male or female and you grew up. It's that you, you feel like you're a woman or a man and you say that. So you bring that reality into existence by words. And this seems minor because most people who think about it superficially assume that only a few people will do that, those people that we call trans. But they miss the fact that it's a statement about all of our realities, that every one of us is male or female or man or woman solely because of what we feel and what we say, that what makes the three of us women is that we say we're women. Well, why would we say we're women? Presumably because we feel like we're women, but we've denied that there's anything real about being a woman. So what is it that makes us women. We feel feminine, womanly. I mean, I sitting here talking to you in a womanly fashion, I don't know. And was I womanly when I was painting a door earlier today? Was I womanly when I was getting a maths PhD? You know, you don't know. So it's just detached. It's detached our identities from any referent in our physical selves or indeed in our social selves, not even our social selves anymore. It's not even that I'm being feminine, I'm acting feminine in the way that Judith Butler talked about. It's just what I say. And this has profound consequences, so profound that I took a whole book to talk about them and it's not the only book talking about them and Abigail will say many more things about them. Thank you. So this is a question for both of you and I think you've already led us in that direction, but you both note that there is there are far-reaching consequences to this topic. Um, this is not a topic that's a personal topic, which it's often considered a personal issue, how I identify myself. And it doesn't belong on the stage, certainly doesn't belong in the public square. Um, and I've had people even in this room tell me, why are we talking about this issue? It's a very personal issue. So my question for both of you would be, um, you both mentioned that there are political, legislative, social implications of this issue today. So why should, I guess my first question is, why should we be talking about this in a room full of people? And uh, if it is a personal issue, and what are some of the ramifications of this issue on those topics I mentioned? So do you want to start with it, start first, Helen? Sure, sure. Um, People don't think about this so much anymore because we don't distinguish between men and women in ordinary everyday life the way that we used to. I mean, it used to be that women couldn't vote and men could, or that men could um, get mortgages and women couldn't. But nowadays, all those unnecessary distinctions have vanished. And what we're left with is not that many distinctions between men and women. But where there are distinctions, it's because of our sex. We separate the sports, we separate sporting competitions for men and women because men and women's bodies are different. We have separate changing rooms, separate domestic um, violence refuges, separate rape, rape crisis centres, separate toilets, because both male and female people are more comfortable, more dignified in separate facilities, and in the case of women, safer, because most violence, and indeed almost all sexual violence, is committed by males, and women are overwhelmingly victims of the sexual violence in particular. So we don't distinguish between men and women except where we really have to and it's sex. So if you 
If you dissolve the idea of what sex is and you replace it by something else, well, then you change the reason why you separate the two sexes in those sorts of circumstances. And it's not about sex anymore. It's about what people say they are. And then you realize that impacts on other people as well. So in the book, I say that gender, gender self-identification is a misnomer. It's actually a demand that other people identify you as the gender that you say you are. So that when I go into a changing room where I expect to only see female people, I might now see male people as well because those male people say that they're female. So that impacts upon me. So that's just one example. I'm sure Abigail would like to add more. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a really good point. So that the sex segregated spaces that still ex exist in our society are related to concrete material conditions that differ between the sexes and primarily to the benefit of women, right? So women's changing rooms are separated not because, you know, women are a particular threat to men, but because vice versa. Um, and I think in, in all these spheres, the one that concerns me the most is prisons. Um, because the argument here is not that, oh, trans people are predatory. Rather, you know, you'll have some bad actors in prison, and if we create a very gameable system where basically, say, a male sex offender can simply tick a box on a form and then be transferred to an all-female facility, um, presume, you know, and this is, a, he might not have to have any sort of physical transition whatsoever because he can he can identify simply by this this statement of language and so and the the women then who are in prison with him it's not like they can just leave right so the the prison situation does concern me quite a bit because that's a very vulnerable population and that's a very gameable system um, I'll also say that one thing I'm I'm increasingly concerned about is the uh, medicalization of gender nonconforming children um, because I think that I think one of the beautiful things about humanity um, is that we're unique individuals I mean each person is a completely unique instantiation of being human right and we're talking about sex differences here but of course there's also a common humanity right and then there's also individual differences so there's kind of these three layers of differences that I think all need to be part of the picture of when we talk about human identity and and I think that because gender and sex differences are are here's my scientific way of expressing a, like bimodal graph, you know, they're kind of like these intersecting humps, basically, right? So you will have individuals here in the middle, um, so men and women who who are maybe, you know, like women whose femininity is more analogous to a typical masculinity and that kind of thing. Um, but what's happening now, because gender is no longer rooted in the body, the only real ground for gender now is in stereotypes. Right, so there's this kind of regressive irony that's happening that a lot of the, the stereotypes that we'd kind of progressed beyond are now once again being made real or being reified, right? So now children are, you know, a, a, let's say a, a girl who's a, a tomboy and who loves rough and tumble play, loves to play sports, hates girly things, you know, no longer is she, is she just sort of like, okay, yeah, sure, that's great, yeah, just be yourself. Now, like, She's, she's invited to question her very identity, like, oh, you must really be a boy, right? Or a boy who loves art and my little ponies. He's, you know, he's now under scrutiny, like maybe he's really a girl. And identity in childhood and adolescence is still so fluid. I mean, that's, that's something that, um, what's the priest who started? CL, I'm just learning about this this Father weekend. Father Giussani. Thank you. <laughs> that's something that Father Giussani writes about, right? Like, hey, there's something that's so exciting about adolescence because everything's so intense and everything's so passionate and everything's so full of possibility and people, young people are discovering who they are, right? But now we're in a cultural moment where young people are being put on, um, put on this road to a lifetime of medicalization and basically all kinds of different experiences, different kinds of, um, of, of suffering or anguish that young people are experiencing. It's kind of being stamped with a very a simple framework, like, oh, you must be trans, and here's the way you solve it. You scapegoat your body. Um, we'll, we'll stop your puberty. We'll put you on um, puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, and then when you're a little older, 
Um, you know, we can amputate your breasts and then you'll be happy. And I think the, the quickness and enthusiasm with, with which this way of, of treating um, people, this kind of, of therapy or what, what I see as really self-harm kind of repackaged as self-care, I think is very disconcerting uh, because um, young people are being allowed to make irreversible decisions that they end up sterile, for example. Um, and then when, you know, let's say if they change their mind later, then sometimes that's, that's impossible to do. And I worry about how much money can be made by this. Because if you, if you commit to um, a medical transition, then you know you you are you know you need to be on say cross sex hormones for life, and there are of course physical very s serious physical consequences and risks of that that no one's really articulating I think and no one's really talking about, um, and that to me I think is the the thing that I get the most worked up about. So I want to ask a question a little bit about, I mean, just to, to, I guess, play devil's advocate. So there are many people today, scientists included, who say that sex is a spectrum, right? Or that um, gender dysphoria is a real thing because of spe sex being a spectrum or the non-binomial that, you know, I'm not one or the other, et cetera, or people being born asexed, right? So can the help, two of you help us understand, um, first of all, where this fits into the question of gender theory. I guess that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to start, Helen? Shall I start? Yeah, yeah. sure. Thanks. So, so the, the sex as a spectrum idea is old too, and it runs historically along the same track as the track that Abigail talked about. And it, it dates back to about the 1920s and 1930s. Um, maybe even a little earlier and the idea was that it was actually gay people were somewhere on the spectrum the idea was that if you were gay you were a man's brain in a woman's body or a woman's brain in a man's body and you were somewhere on the sex spectrum and then when they started to think about people actually being members of the opposite sex despite what their bodies looked like they sort of cannibalized this this idea this quite false idea uh, and and reused it, repurposed it. One of the things you notice when you start digging around in the history of the, of gender identity and of trans ideas is what a cannibalistic um, or magpie movement it is. Like it picks up ideas from from race, from um, about sexuality, all sorts of things like that, and it mixes them all up along with things that it's borrowed from other cultures, like um, the Fafafine of Samoa or the Mushe of Oaxaca or whatever, and and they don't tend to sit together terribly well. So if you if you think that sex isn't real, then what are you thinking sex is a spectrum for? You know, these, these things don't sit together. Like, if sex doesn't exist, well, it isn't a spectrum anyway. I mean, so anyway, no, sexes are not spectrums. We are one sex or the other, and intersex conditions, as they're called, are not actually a disproof of that. Intersex is a rather old-fashioned umbrella term for about 40 conditions that are developmental uh, disorders or differences of development of the, of the gonads and genitalia, and they happen to male people or female people. Yeah. They don't, have, they don't make you something in between. Mm -hmm. And most people who have a DSD, as they're now known, are clearly recognizable as either male or female at birth. A few of them have some ambiguity of the genitalia and have to be investigated further by the doctor. And in the end, the doctor will diagnose the specific DSD that this child has mm -hmm. and say whether it's a boy or a girl and what treatment this child needs. Because mm -hmm. some of these conditions are very serious. They can be life-threatening. Right. So this is just a... It's just a bit of obfuscation. I don't know if you've ever heard of a gish gallop. It's a debating technique where it was named after a particular person whose surname was Gish, where you just throw all sorts of unrelated facts in very quick succession at the person you're debating, and there's no time for them to you know, respond to each individually. And while they do that, they're missing the thread of what you're actually saying. So these things like intersex people and sex as a spectrum and all that stuff, it's just obfuscation. We all know that we all come in two flavors, male and female. We all know that. We all know that what you can tell when you meet people. You can tell it by looking at their face. You can tell it by looking at their general body shape. Um, so yeah, it's just, we all know that's nonsense. It's odd to me that such nonsense has managed to get such wide traction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would echo that and say that 
Um, so DSDs or intersex conditions are best understood as variations within maleness and females, nails, not as exemptions from the reality of sex. Um, so I think that's really important. And in fact, I think the way that certain activists have tried to use the existence of these kind of conditions um, as a way to uproot the reality of sex um, does a lot of disservice to people who are born with these conditions. Because um, I, I never hear intersex conditions brought up in a discussion except to serve as some kind of validation for the idea of the sex binary not being real. It's not really a discussion about, okay, well, what, what uniquely do intersex people need and how can we talk about that in a robust way? And in fact, there are, there are really meaningful differences in the history of intersex activism versus trans activism because one of the, one of the values um, that has been affirmed in intersex activism has been bodily integrity and actually you know, stopping and changing the, the medical approach of, of performing unnecessary cosmetic surgeries on infants who are born with ambiguous genitalia. And so that's actually a, a tension I see between these two movements. So I really think conflating the two is not helpful. It's obfuscating, like, like Helen said, but I also think it's really dehumanizing to people who have um, variations in sexual development. Okay, thank you. So the next question is for you, Abigail. Um, as a Christian, which you have said in many public settings, you have a per particular view of the person. And being as a Catholic, um, you obviously have, you know, probably have a view of the, very similar to that which the Catholic Church says, that body and soul are connected. So the present concept of gender has, for the most part, driven a wedge between, you know, body and soul. So again, can you explain what that wedge would be? and maybe help us understand the implications of that. Sure. Yeah, I think especially coming at this, at this topic from a Christian perspective, especially a Catholic Christian perspective, I mean, Christianity is very much uh, a system of seeing the world and all that is that um, affirms the dignity of the body, the dignity and the goodness of the body. If that's not true, if a Christian understanding of anthropology of a human being as a unity of body and soul isn't true, then all of the central mysteries of Christianity make no sense. The incarnation doesn't make any sense. The resurrection doesn't make any sense. The ascension doesn't make any sense. Like, why would Jesus take a body back up to heaven if it's just his meat Lego suit or whatever, mm -hmm. right? It just doesn't make any sense. Like, why would God even become a body to unite himself with our nature in order to, to um, be able to have communion with us so we could have communion with the divine, right? I mean, all of that, Christianity is so deeply incarnational. Um, so I do think that, that this, I think that this, a framework has emerged for explaining a range of different experiences. And the people who get caught up in this framework deserve our compassion and attention and respect. But I think it's very important that we, that we really take a good look at the framework and realize that what's being offered here is a radically different vision of reality, of the human person, of freedom, of the body, um, than, than the, the Christian understanding of reality. And I think there's a, there's a spiritual dimension here, um, and that's the sacramentality of the body. So in the Christian understanding, sex doesn't matter just because of its, its connection to procreation you know, in an earthly sense. But there's a way in which, you know, every body has a sacramental function. The body reveals the person, right? And I actually think that one of the desires that you can see that's good, that's, that I think is expressed by people who identify as trans, is a desire for their body to express their person, right? Like, that's a good desire, and I think that's something that, that we can pay attention to. But the problem is there's, there's a a lie or a deception about you don't, your body doesn't already reveal your personhood, rather your body is a project, you have to kind of complete it in a, some way or change it in some way in order for it to reveal your personhood. So there's this, this distortion of the sacramentality of the body. Um, but if we, if, we lose, if we lose sight of, of the importance of the body, I think particularly from a Christian perspective, then, then that creates a lot of, um, that creates a lot of very real problems, not just philosophical and theological problems, but problems that then, you know, um, have to do with how we live and be in the world. So, 
Yeah, I'm going to step back just a little bit. It's a question I've been wanting to ask both of you, and Don, I'll just ask it here on the stage, and that is this theory of gender and sex, um, gender theory. It just seems like it came out of nowhere, right? I'm an educator. Um, I work in a school. I have somebody coming from a public school, and then my school saying, hey, I want, want my kid to get into your school because, you know, she's in fourth grade. She's nine years old. She's learning that she needs to either be gay, lesbian, or bi. This is the curriculum's changed in the school next door to my school. I mean, it seems like this came out of nowhere. Ten years ago, I didn't even know what gender was, right? And now it's become, you know, the thing that's driving people away in many, in many cases from the public school. So I guess my question to both of you, um, it seems troublesome to ask, where did this come from today? Like, like you're almost a bigot if you ask the question. Wow, this is this is a very con this is a difficult topic to stop, talk about, so we don't talk about it. So, can both of you kind of address that? First of all, you did do a good job of explaining the history, but can you help us understand? Like, we're in front of this very challenging situation, and no one wants to talk about it, myself included, until I read your book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, shall I start with a bit of it, which is the um, where it came from? Um, and I think a little bit about why no one wants to talk about it, too. So I think it, it's been a fringe movement for decades. Mm -hmm. That's been there. But it's been something that was only in gender clinics and so on. And then when various activist groups, which had worked their way through various other activist purposes, so, you know, um, women got the vote, um, the, Civil, the Civil Rights Act uh, ended Jim Crow laws, and then we got gay marriage in the 2010s. And this pattern was seen very much around the world. A lot of groups needed a next cause. And that idea that trans was the next cause really fitted in so neatly, the next oppressed group that needed our attention. And in some ways, that's a good impulse. But then on the other hand, it was also activists looking for a way not to have to disband and to keep very large and very well-funded um, charities and NGOs running. So I think that that's one of the reasons that it sort of launched onto the public consciousness. It was there, but it, it fitted into a place that we had in our society for um, oppression narratives, for um, liberation narratives, uh, for a way of thinking about people that was already popular as identities you know, male, female, what race you are, what ethnicity you are, what sexuality you are, now another aspect of your personality. And why are we not meant to talk about it? Well, that's so interesting, isn't it? I think partly it's because it's such a mess of a theory that if you're allowed to talk about it, it all falls apart. So they have to try to stop you from talking about it. But it's also this thing that it's a very linguistic movement and language is power language creates reality so if you're allowed to talk about it you are actually altering reality in ways that the activists don't want you to so in silencing you they are carrying out a very good act in their eyes i would add too that there's um so since about well, maybe around 2014 or so there's been an just an exponential rise in the number especially of, of young people who are or people who present to gender clinics for wanting transition. So classically, it was a very, very small number um, in the population would, would seek transition. And it was almost always men, and almost always men in middle age, right? But then two huge shifts happened in um, starting about, I don't know, eight, eight ten years ago. And the, the demographic shifts in two ways. One, it shifted to more women presenting, and then the age shifted way down. And we're talking about like 2,000 increase, 2,000 percent increase, like just exponentially rose. Um, the you know gender clinics were flooded, and so new gender clinics began popping up all over the United States. Now Planned Parenthood offers you know uh, like gender affirming. I think that's what they call like giving you cross sex hormones. And so yeah, I could just walk into a Planned Parenthood clinic today, tell them you know I think I'm trans, and walk out with um, a prescription for testosterone immediately without any kind of assessment by a doctor. Even if I said, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm suicidal, I have an eating disorder, I have a struggle with depression, it wouldn't matter. Like, I would still, I would still get to walk out. So I think, I think that 
the immersive online digitization, especially of youth culture, has played a huge part in this for reasons that Helen mentioned. And then I also think people saw how much money could be made, again, from medicalizing healthy people for life. Um, and so I think those, those things are feeding into it, um, but there, there really is kind of a, a social contagion element, I think, that's, that's happening. Thank you. Thank you both, yeah. So I have one last question for the two of you, which I think is gonna take a bit to flesh out, but um, we have a lot of parents in this room. We have a lot of educators in this room, a lot of um, doctors in this room, and teenagers. And so considering what both of you have learned in your studies, um, neither one of you took this on as a topic of choice. You bumped into it through your work at, you know, at, at The Economist and through your work at the university, et cetera. So what kind of advice would you give to parents and educators to respond to a son, a daughter, a friend, a patient who says they have, who has gender dysphoria or who wants to transition? Um, yeah, how can you help us understand how best to help friends and loved ones to, yeah, deal with their struggle with their given sex? Do you want to go ahead and start, Helen? Sure. I mean, it's a huge question, and I don't like to give the impression that I could swan into somebody's house and in three minutes sort out what is obviously not that simple. But the first thing I'd say, I think Abigail said this, that um, everything gets turned into being about trans now. So one of the things about those teenage gender uh, clinics is uh, that the teenagers turning up at gender clinics is that they're very, very heavily overrepresented um, children on the autistic spectrum, uh, children who are self-harming, um, depressed or anxious children. Uh, these kids often are trying both to express their bodily dis-ease through the medium of gender, through a trans identity, but also they're looking for a panacea because it's sold that yeah. way. Yeah. I talked, when I wrote my book, um, the girl who I talked to, a detransitioner, because these are becoming more common, sadly, now, um, and she said that she had been so ill with an eating disorder that she was hospitalised for the sake of saving her life. And when she was 18, she searched online to see if it was possible to get somebody to remove your breasts without you having um, cancer. And she discovered trans... Um, chat boards and a week later she believed that she was a man but the gender clinic said to her that the reason you have an eating disorder is that you were meant to be a man so your curves are making you uncomfortable if you get a mastectomy and you take testosterone and you go through transition your eating disorder will go and her parents believed them because you believe medical professionals um, so she had a hysterectomy she had her ovaries removed um, she took testosterone by the time she was 21 she was sterile she still had an eating disorder and at 23 she re-identified as a woman so children are looking for a solution to every problem they have and they're told that identifying as trans will solve all their problems mm -hmm. and they will probably have researched online for months before they come out to their parents as trans so they produce what's called the script they will tell you a whole pages long thing that they will have rehearsed and they will have been coached possibly to do it online um, they will be primed to think that you're a bigot if you don't immediately go wow that's amazing fantastic i'm delighted that you're going to medicalize your beautiful body that i carried for nine months within me and gave birth to and fed and have minded up till now so they're prepared to hear what you say very negatively and so that was a very long preamble to saying, you've got to stay calm. You've got to bring your parenting A game here. And um, you've got to say, oh, tell me more, you know, slow it all down, be very low key, and then explore what it is the child is trying to achieve, what they're trying to express with this identification. And then if you want to be listened to, you have to listen yourself. There's no point in just telling your child that this is stupid or that don't be ridiculous, you're really a girl. Um, there's no point either in pulling out a book like mine and handing it to your child and saying, read that and that'll set you straight. I mean, I wish that would work, that'd be great. You have to listen. You have to say, tell me, tell me what you think. Tell me why you're doing this, help me to understand. And then you can hope that you will be listened to in return. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's that's absolutely right. I think. 
like I mentioned before, you know, pe people who, who seek out this kind of, of a very serious change that comes with a lot of risk, you know, no one who feels sort of at peace and content in their life and with themselves is going to seek this out. So there is some kind of anguish or suffering. There's some kind of desire for something that's driving it. And it could be a number of things, right? I mean, we could be talking about, um, you know, I mean, in some, in some, for some instances, it could be someone who's had pretty severe gender dysphoria since they were a child, right? And that, um, and then for someone else, it could be, you know, an autistic kid who never feels like she's fit in. She's, she's a little more interested in, you know, computer science than, than what the other girls like. And so she just assumes she must not really be a girl. You know, there could be a desire for community, a desire for wholeness, right? So I think, I think probably there's some kind of really good desires that are operating underneath it, as well as some profound suffering. So I think, I think being patient and being curious and being calm um, and being committed to this kind of ongoing process of discernment and preserving the relationship. I mean, I think, I think hopefully that would go without saying, but you know, definitely don't you know, lay down an ultimatum or, or say, you know, well, if, if you do this, you know, then I'm going to cut you off and that kind of thing. Like, I think, I think that would be the, the worst possible thing to do. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll also uh, speak from kind of a Catholic perspective about, okay, well, what do we do maybe in our, our parishes or in our schools or in our universities, right? As how do we respond as Catholics? Um, I think in America, I feel fairly pessimistic, I'll be honest, about how this is going to play out in America. I think, I think Europe will be okay. I think Finland, <laughs> Finland will be okay. Finland and Sweden have already started. Yeah, I don't, there's like one Finnish guy out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I say that because, I, you know, I, the, like Sweden and, and Finland are already very much rolling back on, on especially childhood um, transition. And... You know, there's some real amazing pushback happening in the UK, which Helen is a big part of, but the US is a mess. The US is a mess. Um, I worry about a lot of things. I worry about how politicized this is, how polarized our culture is, and now this has just become another kind of sign to plant in your yard, another bumper sticker to put on your car, another way of kind of affiliating with your tribe. Um, and then, of course, once, you're, once you've taken the party line, you know, you just kind of immerse yourself in the echo chamber and. I worry too about the the way that we have a decentralized and profit-driven healthcare system. Um, I just think there's a lot of a lot of not so great things about American society that are letting this thing run amok. But here's maybe one piece of hope, and that is that America also has this it's like kind of a freakishly religious place. <laughs> um, and there's, there's this value of religious freedom. If that's, maybe that's even like the one kind of coherent founding value of our nation is that this is always a place where you could come and be a religious freak and that's great. You know, we won't force you not to be that way. And so I think it is absolutely vital for Christian and Catholic communities and parishes and schools to hold to the Catholic vision of reality and the human person. We, we need to be a place where that truth and that beauty is preserved, that, that we need to be a kind of lighthouse in the culture, like shining that, that light out into the world. And we can't be a bunker, right? So on the one hand, we can't just, just immediately say like, yes, this is awesome, you know, totally affirm anything you want to be, you know, I'm on board, right? Um, but we also can't be like, oh, no. What's wrong with people these days? Like, like the girls look like boys, and oh, you know, like, <laughs> gotta go, like, hide in our bunker, and you know, totally trot out. You know, that's not that's not a, a solution either, right? So the truth has to be preserved, so that th this thing is gonna churn up a lot of people. There are gonna be a lot of people who get churned up by this this ideology and who come out of it pretty destroyed, I think. And also maybe, you know, have, having certain kinds of a physical appearance that is, isn't really going to change. So our, our parishes also need to be places where, you know, gender non-conforming people and, 
you know, people who maybe have once identified as trans or kind of exploring it or have detransitioned, that they're not going to be scrutinized, um, that they're not going to be rejected, that they're not going to be shut out. So I think that is the task for, um, for Christians and, and Catholics, I think. And Catholics are the best prepared to do it because we have a coherent theology of the body and the human person. Like, we have the most resources um, on that front. Um, so, but, you know, Protestant allies, you know, that's great too. You know, you're welcome, welcome aboard. <laughs> pillage, our, pillage our treasury. Um, but I, I do think it's really, I do think it's really important. Um, in fact, I honestly, I don't know, I'm just gonna go on a limb and say this, I could change my mind later, but um, I really think that if America has any hope on this front, it will be because Christians keep their head about this stuff and, and have the courage to speak about it what I would love, I would love to hear priests give homilies on, like maybe the next time the you know, Genesis 2 rolls around in the lectionary, to give this beautiful homily about the sacramentality of the sexed body, and then to say, you know, and, you know, and if you're someone who really struggles with this, and you don't feel at home in your body, you know, like come talk to me, come tell me your story, like we want you to be here, and we want to understand you, and walk with you. Like that would be a wonderful way to talk about it, to present the truth and beauty of the faith, but then also this invitation, um, and then and making good on that promise to accompany people as they as they kind of wander around um, seeking truth. <laughs> Helen, did you want to say anything else on that? I saw you nodding your head crazily. Did you want to add? I just thought it was, ab yeah, I thought it was absolutely beautiful what Abigail said. And you know, I'm not someone. I was brought up Catholic, but I'm not someone who still is Catholic. And yet, something that for me, I can find no other word to express the way I feel about my children's bodies and how beautiful those bodies are than the word sacred. Um, so a sort of secular sacredness, I think, is something that. Um, atheists like myself or people who aren't religious or have different religious traditions and Catholics can come together on. I mean, the, the, just the idea that my child's body was not born perfect. And I would think that if he were ill, I would think it if he had a disability, I would think it if he was, I mean, I, I didn't mind what sex I had, but you know, whether if he was a boy or a girl, the fact is he was his own unique little self. And if I can borrow a, an incredibly inappropriate word for it from my day job at The Economist, um, we use the word fungible for go goods that are totally interchangeable. So one barrel of oil is as good as another barrel of oil of the same quality, so they're fungible goods. Well, humans are non-fungible goods. Mm. The people that we love are not interchangeable. The people that we meet are unique individuals who were born and will die and we will never see them again in this world. It's, it's just a one-off thing. So I think we've forgotten that in our culture very generally and whether that's because of a move away from religion or whether it's the way that we've become very technological or that we're afraid to say things that some people might not agree with. But yes, this, this idea of the sacred and the beauty of the people that we love and the perfection of them the way they are I think that might be a helpful way to talk to a child, whether your family is religious or not, that they're really lovely the way they are. You've loved them since the second you knew you were expecting them. And then when you met them, you fell in love all over again, you know? Yeah. Thank you very much, Helen. Thank you very much, Abigail. Gosh, I just, my whole mind has been opened. So by both of you ladies, and this will continue to be a topic I'm interested in, hopefully all of us. We have, we have one important announcement. That was amazing. And I just want to say that this has been an amazing day of beautiful conversations, profound, moving, 
And of course, I have to ask you if you could consider giving to the encounter so that we can keep doing this every year. Awesome. We want to keep doing this. Thank coming you. Up next, <laughs> coming up next is 5.30 p.m., What Never Dies, The Life of Dr. Tagashi Nagai and His Wife Midori with Gabriela De Comite, President of the Friends of Tagashi and Midori Nagai Association, Chad Deal, Historian and Instructional Designer at the University of Virginia, and Dominic Higgins, Movie Director. This story you will not want to miss. And finally, at 7.30, we celebrate the beauty within the encounter, the beauty within the beauty in the encounter, which is our volunteers, the urge for singing. Thank you, everyone.
at 5.30, our last appointment here on the main floor auditorium. What Never Dies, a presentation on the life of Dr. De Takashi Nagai and his wife, Midori. And this evening, at 7.30, this urge for singing with the New York Encounter volunteers. Still a little time to swing by the donation desk. Please help.
Take your seat for what never dies. Take your seats, please.
We ask you to kindly take your seats as the event is about to begin. I start Somos because I saw the need to change healthcare. The human life and all their needs is important. The Asian community and the Latino community are the most underserved community. All providers in Somos speak the same language and also they understand their culture. So it's much easier for us to understand the patient and to provide a service to the patient understanding their circumstances to try to give them guidance in a way that they could actually implement. We take care of your family, we take care of you, we take care of the community. It that is a network of physicians dedicated to providing services to the most vulnerable. The local treatment, disease prevention and research but also from policy point of view. The less privileged, the underserved, the underinsured, those are the people that we serve. The mission is the care of the poor, feed the hungry, the care of the sick for the soul of the people.
So good evening and welcome to the last talk of this 2022 edition of the New York Encounter on behalf of the organizers. My name is Gabriele Di Comite. I'm the president of the Friends of Takashi and Midori Nagai Association. I will be moderating this, uh, this panel and I will also be one of the speakers together with Chad Dill, who is here with me, and together with Dominic Higgins, who has kindly accepted to join. He's live from the UK in Live Connection. So I would also like to thank Somos, who has uh, supported us in this um, uh, event and has made this possible. So first of all, uh, about the two speakers. So Chad Deal is a historian and instructional designer at the University of Virginia. And he has been doing research in the field of uh, the modern history of Japan, especially related to human experience in the war and post um, in the aftermath of the war, especially about the non-military forces driving the reconstruction after the, after the war. And he's uh, author of a book which is titled Resurrecting Nagasaki, which will be the, the main topic of his talk tonight. And this is how we get to, I got to know him. And we, yeah, I can say we became friends and this is one of the beautiful uh, encounters we had after the association was started. And from UK, there is Dominic, uh, Dominic Higgins, who is a movie director. In 2003, he founded, together with his brother Jan Higgins, he founded a movie production uh, firm called Pixel Revolutions Films. And this I really have to read because they have produced a lot of movies in an experimental animated and live action video. Uh, the first one, I think it was The Wolf Who came, uh, came In From The Cold, which was awarded the International Digital Video Festival in Los Angeles Award and Birmingham TIC Film Festival, and <clears throat> many other uh, very successful movies, including The 13th Day. And one of them was a big project, which is All That Remains, about the life and story of uh, Takashi uh, Nagai, and this is why Dominic is here with us uh, tonight. Um, so, What Never Dies, it's about Takashi Paul Nagai. M many of you, some of you at least, uh, I'm sure you know him from the book by Paul Glynn, uh, which you probably have read, which is called The Song for Nagasaki, and there was here in New York Encounter an exhibit about Takashi Nagai in 2019. So you might, you might have heard uh, about him, but not, not all of you probably. So Takashi Nagai was uh, a young uh, student of medicine when in Nagasaki. He, was, he, came, he came from a, a family which was not um, a Christian family, was of Shinto origin. And he, was, he, he has always been strongly driven from a, a really strong uh, urge for truth. This is really the force that has always driven him. I think that this is really the fear rouge of his entire life. And some happening in his life, especially the, the death of uh, his mother, uh, brought him to question the sense of his life. He immediately understood that life should have a, life and death should have a meaning. And he had heard a lot about uh, the Catholic faith. He decided to understand more about the Catholic faith, and he decided to go and live in Urakami. You have to remember this name. Urakami is the northern area of the city of Nagasaki, which was the place where for 250 years the hidden Christians of Japan had lived. So for 250 years in Japan there were very, um, uh, uh, very uh, bad persecutions and Christianity was almost completely cancelled. There were only a few thousand people living in the north of, in the surroundings of Nagasaki, especially in the area of Urakami and they were able to preserve and um, transmit the faith uh, in this little area uh, around uh, Nagasaki. The descendants of the, the, the hidden Christians were there and he decided to meet them. And in the encounter with the hidden Christians and especially with Midori Moriyama, who would become his wife, he uh, converted himself to the, to the faith. Uh, he, Midori was for him an incredible testimony of what real faith and virginity is. Virginity, she was his wife, but uh, his wife, but she was virginity in the sense of 
total dedication of her life to her vocation, which was the vocation of, 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 of wife for him. And it was really looking at her that he understood what real faith in life is. Uh, he dedicated himself completely to, to science, to his work as a radiologist, as a doctor, and as a university professor. And he, he dedicated him so much to the radiology in those times that he developed leukemia. And uh, by 1945, he already was affected by leukemia in a pretty advanced, advanced stage. On August, uh, the 9th of August, 1945, uh, the second atomic bomb was dropped on the city of Nagasaki. And the, in, that hit exactly the area of Urakami, which, which, was, which had been the heart of Catholicism in, in, uh, in Japan for around 300 years since the arrival of St. Francis Xavier. Urakami was completely destroyed, and the wife of Takashi uh, Nagai, Midori, uh, died together with most of the people there. He survived because he was working in the radiology department and he was protected by the, uh, by the, by the building. And after he, the destruction and the bomb, he has lost completely everything. The city does not exist anymore. His wife is not with him anymore. He has lost all his friends. He has lost his work, his colleagues. He is already affected by leukemia, and he will, will, will spend the remaining year, years of his life uh, confined into a bed because of uh, leukemia. Um, he started writing books, and he became uh, extremely famous. In his books, he shows the power of faith as able to bring life and hope in the total destruction. He became such a powerful testimony, uh, witness of hope and peace that his books became a great editorial success all over Japan and beyond Japan. Uh, he, he earned a lot of money from the books, but he donated everything because he decided to live in total poverty. Um, the story of Nagai became so important for us, for me and a few other friends, that we decided to found the association, Friends of Takashi and Midori Nagai. And in these last two or three years, there were so many encounters, like probably Two of the most significant are, are for sure the ones with uh, Chad and with Dominic, and that's why we are here today. So I would like to show you now a short video be before we start with um, the real part of, uh, of this presentation. And in this video, I think we will get a bit of a sense of who Takashi Nagai was.
So I wanted to show you the video because I, I would really like to, would like you to, to make the effort to, to realize the situation where Nagai was living. Because we will now, with the help of our friend John, John McCarthy, we will hear some uh, readings from, that, from the beautiful book that Nagai wrote in, um, when he lived in, in his bed. And in order to understand the, the, the magnitude of what he says, we, we really should keep in, uh, in our mind uh, clear the situations where he was living. There was nothing, nothing anymore around himself. He had lost completely everything. He was living in a city which was completely destroyed. He had uh, nothing anymore. Uh, he didn't have a house anymore, and he was not able to leave um, his bed. So let's hear from his own words how he was able to live in those conditions. As soon as I wake up, the first thought that occurs to me every morning is that I'm happy. Again, today, I'm alive. Even if I'm only able to use my hands and head, I find myself filled with enthusiasm, like a schoolboy eager to go on the morning of a class trip. It has been an achievement of this last period to find myself surprised every morning as I lie in bed, filled with this expectation of joy at the prospect of a new day. I am discovering that I have in me the heart of a child. If only we were able to carry out our everyday tasks with the passion of a poet, as if composing the verses of a haiku, how much beauty would permeate the workplace? We should turn our lives into poetry. We should let the poet's attentive and admiring gaze penetrate beneath the surface of things, so as to glimpse the beauty that hides itself in each thing, and allow that beauty to shape our every action and thought, whether we find ourselves toiling away in the noisy factory or tossing on a fishing boat far out at sea, or working in this shop among people. I have finally reached this new horizon. Beating within me is a child's heart. The life of a new day awaits me, real joy in this bed of mine, six feet long, that I cannot even leave. But it is life without the goad of duties and the ties of prohibitions that would stop the audacity of this heart that every morning sets to work anew. As soon as I wake up, the first, first thought that occurs to me every morning is that I'm happy. Beating within my chest is a child's heart. The life of a new day awaits me. How is this even possible in those conditions to, to have these expectations at the beginning of a day? I mean, the question is really, is this guy disconnected from reality? Is this guy a fool? But then why do thousands of people, literally thousands of people, go and look for him every day? Simple people and people from, from all Japan and then people from the rest of the world and the emperor go, went and visited him and the Pope sent him letters and there were people from the world of culture, of science and Thousands of normal people were just going to visit him every day in search for a glimpse of hope and peace. He was the only glimpse of hope and peace that could be found in that moment in the entire of what remains of the city of Nagasaki. We should let the poet's attentive and admiring gaze penetrate beneath the surface of things so as to glimpse the beauty that hides itself in each thing and allow the beauty to shape every action and thought. How can he have this gaze? How can he see beauty in the total destruction of the atomic wasteland? Where is that beauty? How can he find beauty beneath the surface? 
Why was he able to do that and other people were not able to do that? Well, this is a question that we have to ask Takashi Nagai, so. The view I enjoy from my bed is by no means limitless. It's confined by the house's low wooden beam and the profile of the mountain beyond the church. Yet it is just enough to allow me to enjoy the feeling of a boundless sky, clear and bright, without the shadow of a cloud. I was reminded of the view of Urakami I had on the night of a full moon, a little more than 10 days after the city had been reduced to nothing by the atomic fire. That night, just like today, there wasn't a single cloud in the sky and a clear light illumined the ash-covered hills. Up until today, no light like that had ever been seen. A night without the shadow of a cloud in the sky and not a trace of a wave rippling across the ocean surface. A little more than 10 days before that night here in Urakami, thousands of homes and tall buildings still stood out against the sky, beginning with the great church. When all of a sudden, tens of thousands of people found themselves wandering aimlessly and in anguished desperation, with the terrifying sound of air raid sirens filling their ears, each one clutching some object in his hands and regretting only that he was alive still. In an instant, the city was no more, and everything that was human, greed, love, hate, angry recrimination, had disappeared without a trace. That evening, 10 days later, there was nothing living to be seen, nothing moving. Just a hill covered in ash, illumined by the moon's glow, and not a thing left standing upon it to cast any shade. That city, once so rich in humanity, which had formerly animated so many shadows, was now a lifeless hill on which shadows were no longer visible. As I gazed upon it, I felt in my heart the transience of human life, and it occurred to me that every craving was senseless. My beloved wife was dead. My laboratory and my research had been destroyed, my home, and all my possessions had been reduced to ashes. My health was already shot, and I knew that very soon I would no longer be able to work. Everything was gone. And yet, while I was thinking these thoughts, and as my gaze wandered out over the land, boundless and unshaded, I discovered to my surprise that I felt neither regret nor sadness at having lost everything. What perishes, perishes. What dies, dies. Seeing the few remnants of all that had been lost, I realized how foolish we are, we human beings, in our obsessive craving for things that die, and in fighting not to let them be taken away once we have secured them. At that point, I felt liberated when I realized that what I had to seek was something that doesn't die, when I realized that I had to seek the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, a great new hope took root in my heart. The kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. These are the things that never perish, that we will never be deprived of. At that moment, my heart was also flooded with an indescribable light untouched by shadows. 
A little more than five years have passed, and tonight the moonlight spreads itself as high in the sky as it did that night. The atomic wasteland is inhabited once more. Homes are being built, and the vortex of love and hate and greed of the human world once again appears to toss and turn. And the shadows have returned to the earth. And what about my heart now? Is it still like that night five years ago, boundless and without the shadow of a cloud? How precious was my feeling of nostalgia that night. How precious was my feeling of nostalgia that night. That is the difference between Nagai and well, I would say almost all the other people there. In the moment when the circumstances are more dire, the worse the circumstances become, the stronger the cry of the heart becomes. And that's the point where the freedom has to make a pure decision. Do I still want to, to listen to the, give credit to the cry of my heart? Or do I want to give credit to the temptation that everything is hopeless, that there's no possibility for life anymore. How precious was my feeling of nostalgia that night. That is the decision of the heart of Nagai. He realizes the preciousness of that moment. He realizes that until that moment, he had been searching for, at least he had been hanging to something which was to die. And for him, that is the beginning of a new life. From that moment on, he realizes what is true is not what I, the life I was living before, is my nostalgia tonight, is the cry of my heart now. I need to find what never dies. So we asked ourselves, how is, that how is it possible to have that case? So this is the first resource that Nagai hangs to. It's the cry of his heart, which in that moment is stronger than ever in his life before. That's why he says, when I realized that what I had to seek was something that doesn't die, I felt liberated. But that's still not enough because he has something else in his life. When I realized that what I had to seek was something that doesn't, doesn't die, when I realized that I had to seek the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. He says, a great new hope took root in my heart. He has something in his life. He has a seed of experience in his life that there is something that never dies. So that's his starting point after the destruction of the atomic bomb. The cry of his heart and the evidence in his life that there is something that never dies. That is the starting point for him. As he says in another beautiful book, I was starting a new life. What is, what is most interesting to understand about Nagai in this moment is that if this is the starting point, then there is a, an entire journey that he decides to start. So this is the resources he hangs to, but then he starts a journey. And let's hear what this journey is. Five years have passed since then, and our movement for peace has never ceased. We have continued without a break to proclaim the value of that sacrifice. But come to think of it, have we not missed something in all of this? Was it not we, the survivors, who misappropriated the sacrifice of those hundreds of thousands of people who gave up their lives in the atomic cloud in order to bring about peace? In order to maintain the world peace achieved by that sacrifice, another new sacrifice would have been necessary. Prayers that call for sacrifices without offering any of their own are just egotism. The citizens of Hiroshima and Nagasaki have prayed for peace, but what did they themselves offer in sacrifice for it? Have we freely 
offered such a sacrifice? Beginning today, we must engage in sincere self-reflection and offer another new sacrifice, greater than that of the atomic bomb. Let it be the day of a new prayer. Let it be the sacrifice of a change in ourselves, each for himself, a real movement for peace, in justice, with patience and love, and with humility and determination. The sort of life of poverty that I live, I live of my own free will. I don't live this way because I have to, But how could I, alone among these people, live in luxury? It doesn't matter how much money I make from sales of my books. If we understand that the sole purpose that some are given so much is that they put it at the service of their neighbor, then it can no longer be said that heaven's plan is unjust. I have been given the ability to earn dozens of times more than that old woman over there peddling food from a cart. And it would not be according to heaven's will that I spend dozens of times more than her on lavish extravagances. To my mind, it is truer that I live on the same level as the peddler and use all the excess money to serve the needs of the entire neighborhood. In this way, my heart finds peace. These are the reasons why I choose to live in poverty. This is the new life that he decides to, to start in that moment. He understands in his experience that there is something that never dies, and he wants to, to give his entire life to that. That is the sacrifice he's talking about. This, I would like all of us to understand this point because I think that this is really the most important one. The sacrifice he's talking about is not the sacrifice of our life, of his own life. It's the sacrifice of his images. It's the sacrifice of his instincts. It's the sacrifice of how, of what he was looking for in his previous life, to let everything go and give himself only to what never dies, which is poverty. Which again, poverty is being rich only of what never dies. This is the sacrifice that he starts. There is no spontaneity in the position of Nagai. It's a long journey, it's a long work on himself that he does for the remaining six years of his life. And it's this long, long uh, journey on himself, which is the conversion of his heart, which is the source of the hope that he's able to, to bring to the entire city of Nagasaki. Because this is, this is the point. What, what's, what's the point of one heart like Nagai to, to change, to be being able to experience this hope and this peace if the rest of the world is still remains in the same, like the entire city of Nagasaki in that situation. What, what's the point of the testimony of, of Takashi Nagai? Is what Takashi Nagai is uh, showing us, is it true only for him, or is this the truth, the one with the capital T? Because if that is the truth, it must be true for us today and for the entire city at that time. And that's where it comes to our two speakers. So let me maybe start from Dominic. So Dominic, uh, What's the point of the testimony of Takashi Nagai in your life? What, what, how did, did Takashi Nagai affect your life? Well, I, I think I better start by how I discovered Dr. Nagai's story. Um, Dr. Nagai's story, I think it's very much about Providence. Um, that's very much how he found his story um, a few years back. 
uh, we initially we were working on a documentary that touched on um, the bombing of Hiroshima. And while we were there, while we were researching that subject, we started to come across stories about Nagasaki. And one name, well, really one title stuck out uh, to us, and that was The Saints of Urikami. So that started us on the journey to find out just who was this so-called Saint of Urikami. We discovered that, well, it was, it was a man who had this incredible story to tell. It was a, a scientist who had converted to Christianity, not despite being a scientist, but because he was a scientist. Today, Dr. Takeshi Nagai is best remembered as an atomic bomb survivor and peace activist uh, whose writing helped to heal a nation that had been completely devastated by war. In fact, his work led to him being honoured as a national hero of Japan. And today, uh, that legacy continues to live on in the Tadashi Nagai Peace Award, which was set up to promote writings and essays uh, on love and peace from all over Japan. Uh, Takashi spent his final years living in a small hut in the middle of the atomic wasteland, writing a great number of books and essays, much of it centered on the atomic bomb. His most famous book, uh, which you already mentioned, was The Bells of Nagasaki, which in 1951 was actually made into a film. Um, Dr. Nagai even got to watch it shortly before his own death. So that book, that really seemed the natural place to start our journey. We bought a copy, and I think it was about halfway through um, when we said, this has to be our next project. Uh, at the time, we didn't know how we were going to do it. Uh, it was a very ambitious project to take on, but we knew we had to try somehow. So uh, we visited Nagasaki, spent time in the locations, visiting Nokoda, Dr. Guy's tiny hut where he spent his final years, uh, which is now a museum, and had the opportunity to meet and talk with several of the survivors, the um, Bukashu, uh, to hear their personal accounts, um, which, I mean, that through the all that terrible devastation and unimaginable human suffering really to sharp focus for us. Um, so I think that's when the story became really a lot more of a commitment for us. But while we were there, we also wanted to find out more about Christianity in, in Japan, uh, as this was going to radically shape Takashi's own life. Uh, it was through, through his faith that he would come to find meaning in the aftermath of the bombing uh, when we lost everything. So, uh, and just as importantly, the woman who was to become his wife, Midori, was a descendant of the hidden Christians. Now, Christianity in Japan can actually be traced all the way back to 1549, when Francis Xavier first arrived in Kaposhimi, which means that it actually predates Christianity in America. I mean, that was absolutely fascinating to learn for us. So we took the opportunity while we were there to visit Nara and interview Father Paul Glynn, whose biography on Tadashi Nagai, a song from Nagasaki, had been so inspirational for us while we were working on the screenplay. And while we were there, we had the opportunity to spend some time in a small Christian community. And that really did have quite a profound impact on me, which I, I wasn't expecting. It was just spending time with this small community, and it is a very much a community that was just held together by this shared faith. Now, apparently, there has been some debate as to whether or not this community should actually be considered Christian at all. After all, they had to exist for much of their history separated from the church. But I've also read someone once described them as old Christians, and I like that. Reading and listening to their stories, some of which are still within, very much within living memory, it's like taking a glimpse into the lives of those early Christians, having to practice faith in secrecy, and having to live under constant threat of persecution, punishment, and even death. There's something definitely very authentic about their faith. And while we were there, we actually attended a, a mass being led by Father Paul Glynn. And that, I, for some reason, I felt really moved on that mass. I mean, the words sounded beautiful spoken in Japanese. And maybe it's because I'd come to learn their history. Remember, this is a community that's experienced real persecution up until very recent times. But it's strange to think that Takashi himself described his first experience in a church, which was a Christmas Eve mass, 
as feeling something which I've been later described as a living presence in that church. So in that was fascinating. Now, our film project took us about five years to make, and it was a, a real struggle at the time. But uh, myself and Ian, it was an absolute privilege to have had the opportunity to get to know Dr. McGuire and Midori and to learn their story, to learn about this part of history, which, to be honest, was a complete mystery to us when we started. And the Catholic Church has already honoured Tadashi with the title Servant of God, which is befitting a man born into a samurai family, for all the word samurai means to serve. He's already on his first step to sainthood. But to many people in Nagasaki and around the world, Takeshi Nagai is already considered a saint. We're very grateful to Gabriel for reaching out to us and letting us know about the friends of Takeshi and the guy, and for allowing us to continue on on this journey. I'd like to pass you back to Gabriel and, and Chad. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dominic. So after 70 years, 80 years, we are still here talking about Takashi and, and Midori Nagai. So it's, it's really the, the power of, uh, of one heart that converts and shows the beauty uh, of, of faith, how faith is able to restart hope and, 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 and life in, uh, in the worst possible condition that you can, could imagine that is, is calling us here together today. But it's not only us today, because what is even more interesting is what, even, what is uh, as, as interesting as this is what happened uh, at the time of Takashi Nagai in the city of Nagasaki. And this is what I would like to ask Chad. Chad has, uh, has done an incredible job. And what is more interesting is that he has done this research with the eyes of, of science, of history, and not with the eyes of... Uh, of faith, because he, he really did it for, for, for his professional um, uh, researches, and he, he was, so, sorry, if I, I, I don't want to anticipate what you're going to say, I just want to say that he was interested in understanding how the, restart, the restarting of Nagasaki started, and he ended up realizing how crucial was the testimony of Nagai, who had been living in that hut, two by two meters, without even going out, and still he was able to to move an entire city around his, just, yeah, around his testimony. So, Chad. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for attending in person and attending online. And to my daughter who's attending online, rest assured, as promised, I am wearing the socks with the pandas on them. I won't be able to see that. <laughs> Um, I'd also like to express my sincere gratitude to the organizers and volunteers of the encounter and to my fellow panelists for the opportunity to speak to you all this evening. <clears throat> I begin with a photograph taken by the United States Marines in early 1946. They called the Urakami District the Valley of Death because of its level of destruction, the presence of rotting corpses still underneath the rubble, and the persistent radiation which made even the American Marines uh, fall ill with radiation poisoning. I share this photograph to help you get a visual idea of the devastation from which Nagasaki had to rebuild. My entire professional career began with a single encounter. Exactly 21 years ago this month, my brother Matt and I visited the Atomic Bomb Museum in Nagasaki and came across an exhibit dedicated to the Catholic community of the Urakami district whose uh, neighborhood was literally ground zero of the atomic bombing. In that exhibit was this photograph and a description of Nagai Takashi and his post-war work writing about the city's experience. I was fascinated by the fact that Nagasaki was home to the largest community of Catholics in Japan I was confused by the realization that a mostly Christian nation, the United States, had dropped a bomb on that community, and I was compelled to learn more about them, and especially about their parishioner leader, Nagai Takashi. And so, at the museum's bookstore on our way out, I bought one of Nagai Takashi's books, Leaving These Children Behind, which I hoped would also strengthen my Japanese reading skills. Upon returning to the United States, I began reading the book and came across the following passage, which appears in a chapter aptly titled Providence. Amid his description of 
hundreds of dead schoolgirls school whose corpses lined a riverbed. Nagai wrote, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Let us always praise the name of the Lord. Those of us left living who saw the dead thought that the atomic bomb was not divine punishment at all, but that it was no different from the expression of some profound plan of divine providence. That same day, I too had become a weak, penniless person and had embraced two small children in the fire ruins. I don't know what it was, but I believed and never doubted that this was the expression of the providence of love. I have endured three years since the bombing, but the fact that my faith that day was correct will gradually come to be proven. Because of the atomic bomb, the obstruction that was blocking my righteous path was removed, and I became able to taste true happiness. Death that will come to me soon is also the greatest gift of love that I confront, I who am God's and who increases in his infinite love. Now, my initial feeling after reading this passage was that my reading comprehension in Japanese was absolutely terrible. I was sure that I was reading something incorrectly because how could a person who had endured so much trauma and suffering interpret the bombing in such a light? I read the passage several more times and realized, yes, that's exactly what the Japanese text was saying. So my next reaction was, what? <laughs> For me, this moment turned into a decades-long scholarly quest to histor historicize and comprehend the context of Nagai's interpretation of the bombing and the effect that it had on Nagasaki memoryscapes. I've since published a book in 2018 entitled uh, Resurrecting Nagasaki, Reconstruction and the Formation of Atomic Narratives. Nagai Takashi, of course, figures largely in my discussion. What I concluded from the 15 years of research that preceded the publication of the book was that Nagai Takashi was the most influential single contributor to the reconstruction of Nagasaki City. From 1945 to 1947, Nagai contributed first to the spiritual recovery of the Urakami Catholic community as their parishioner leader. The atomic bombing killed approximately 8,000 of the roughly 10,000 Urakami Catholics. Many Catholic survivors felt that God had forsaken them or that the bombing was some kind of divine punishment. Some non-Catholic believers from the southern part of the city had been saying as much, that the Catholics were being punished for not being Shinto believers. In response to this, and as a way to help process the trauma of the bombing, especially the loss of their loved ones and other community members, Nagai Takashi developed his um, argument that the bombing was not divine punishment, but rather a manifestation of God's love for the Urakami Catholics. Nagai, too, had lost his dear wife, Midori, and he needed to find meaning in her death and in the suffering of the survivors who lived with immeasurable trauma. Nagai took the opportunity of a mass funeral service for the Urakami Catholic community amid the ruins of their cathedral on November 23, 1945, to convey that narrative of the bombing to help them make sense of the trauma and begin community and individual recovery. During the lengthy eulogy, Nagai declared, if one considers the fact that the atomic bomb, which had aimed for the vicinity of the prefectural office in the heart of the city, drifted to the north because of the weather, and fell in Urakami right in front of our cathedral, along with the fact that this atomic bomb was the last act of war and fighting did not happen anywhere on earth after it, one will realize that there exists a deep connection between the destruction of Urakami and the end of the war. In other words, the church of Urakami was placed on the altar of sacrifice as atonement for the sin of humankind, which was the world war. It was chosen as a pure lamb, slaughtered and burned. We believe this. Alas, the great holocaust that was made in the presence of this cathedral on August 9th and duly ended the darkness of the great world war and shined the light of peace. Even in the nadir of sadness, we reverently viewed this as something beautiful, something pure, and something sacred. Let us always praise the work of the omniscient and omnipotent Lord. Let us give thanks for the church of Urakami having been chosen out of the entire world to be offered in the Holocaust. The word Holocaust in Japanese uh, is hansai, meaning, of course, in its uh, original meaning, burnt offering unto God. Nagai Takashi's eulogy gave meaning to the destruction by framing it as a providential tragedy. It exemplified atonement for the sin of, for the sin of humankind, which was the World War. And only the Urakami Catholics were the worthy sacrifice or the, for the burnt offering or Holocaust. The bereaved took Nagai's message to heart. 
One community member recalled decades later, we were convinced by Nagai's interpretation of the bombing, even the people who had thought it was divine punishment. Another member shared how Nagai inspired the Catholic community with his leadership and service, explaining, he was such a good person that some people thought God had delivered him to us. When Nagai became bedridden with leukemia, which he had contracted before the atomic bombing, he decided to begin writing as much as he could to leave a record of the experience and significance of the atomic bombing. This led to the second stage, so to speak, of his contributions to the reconstruction of the city. From 1948 until his death in 1951, and really beyond, Nagai's work as a writer contributed to the physical rebuilding of the landscape of Nagasaki City. During that time, he published nine books of his own, two edited volumes of essays by other survivors, and two translations of book, bu books by Western authors. He also wrote books and essays that were published posthumously. His books came at a crucial moment for the recovery of Nagasaki when the city, and indeed all cities around Japan, struggled to secure funds for the reconstruction projects. Oops. Nagai's first major best-selling book was Leaving These Children Behind in 1948, which was the book I had brought home with me from the Atomic Bomb Museum in February of 2001. In its first year of printing, the book sold 220,000 copies. A national newspaper poll in September 1949 of the most read books over the previous year included three books by Nagai Takashi, Leaving These Children Behind at number one, The Bells of Nagasaki at number four, and Rosary Chain at number 16. Incidentally, the translation of John Hersey's Hiroshima uh, appeared much lower at 19th. Nagai's books earned him massive royalties. During the 1948-1949 fiscal year, when Leaving These Children Behind and The Bells of Nagasaki were published, he earned 2,176,333 yen in royalties. Even so, he never considered this enormous gain in wealth his own. Rather, he thought it belonged to the people of Nagasaki. And so he gladly paid around 90% in national and city taxes, and he donated the majority of the rest of the income directly to the city. When the public expressed surprise and confusion over why Nagai had to pay so much in taxes, he told one of his friends, the payment of tax is a shared responsibility for the reconstruction of Japan. Taxes are the oil for the reconstruction of our country. The popularity of Nagai's books also helped bring national attention to the special case of Nagasaki as an atomic bomb city, resulting in additional funds. In 1949, Nagasaki jumped to the top of the list, along with Hiroshima, for national reconstruction funds. Until then, Nagasaki had been 31st on a list of 41 cities slated to receive those funds. Hiroshima had already sat pretty highly at sixth. In response to the resulting national reconstruction law, Nagai Takashi decided to donate the rest of his royalties after tax to the Nagasaki International Cultural City Construction Fund to improve the infrastructure of the city. He believed that donating to this fund directly would help the entire city, including Urakami, to all rise at once. When a friend asked Nagai why he didn't put away more money for his children, he responded, we must raise the general level of the area. If everyone improves, then my children will also improve. The revitalization of Urakami and the reconstruction of Nagasaki are our serious responsibilities. In other words, for Nagai Takashi, writing books was his way of working to lay a foundation for the future of all of the children of Nagasaki. When I received feedback on the earliest draft of my book on Nagasaki, one of my mentors said, or criticized, that my chapters on Nagai read like an official hagiography, as though I revered him like a saint. I found her comment fair, but also strange, because in the interest of full disclosure, I am not Catholic, nor am I religious, to be honest. So why did my chapters on Nagai come across, as she put it, overly hagiographic? At any rate, I wanted my book to be as objective as possible, so I revised, rewrote, edited down the chapters on Nagai. But even after so many revisions, his presence in the post-war history of Nagasaki's reconstruction, as I tell it in my book, remains so prominent that it might still strike some readers as overly hagiographic. Nagai has not been without his critics, even in the present. I, too, have discussed Nagai critically from a historian's perspective, especially in regards to how his narrative of the atomic bombing has sometimes overshadowed 
the atomic experience of other survivors, both Catholic and non-Catholic alike. But as a historian, I must also acknowledge the context within which Nagai had worked. The devastation and uncertainty of the immediate post-war period had called on him to be a spiritual leader and community advocate. For Nagai, the most important mission that he undertook at the time, I think, was keeping faith alive at all costs because he understood and truly believed in the role that faith could play in bringing the city back from the brink of oblivion. In other words, and while my own faith has remained broken since childhood, studying the Gai Takashi introduced me to the power of faith, and especially to how faith can illuminate a path to recovery, even out of the darkness of the so-called valley of death. I would like to end with a poem which Nagai considered a prayer, expressing optimism for the future of his children, Nagasaki, and the world. The English translation uh, is Nagai's own. Heiwa yo, heiwa yo, heiwa no kane wa naru. Kono heiwa wo itsu itsu made mo. Peace, oh peace. The bell of peace is tolling. We must keep this peace forever. Thank you. I, I can only comment what Chad and Dominic have said, mentioning again Nagai, because this is really the, the, the key message that I would like to ask to bring home, not only at the end of this panel, but at the end of, I mean, at least what I experienced from this, um, uh, from this uh, New York Encounter edition of 2022. I, I, I heard a lot talking about the, the struggle of nowadays with the pandemic and with many other issues we are going through, and the, the basic question is, where is truth here? How can we restart living in uh, such difficult conditions? He says, five years have passed since then, and our movement for peace has never ceased. We have continued with a break, without a break to proclaim the value of that sacrifice. He's referring to the sacrifice of the atomic bomb. We can talk about the sacrifice of COVID. We can we can keep on our movement for, for peace, our movement for any social uh, claim that we have, for anything which in our life we want to, to claim and demand. But then he says, but haven't we not missed something in all of this? Beginning today, we must engage in sincere self-reflection and offer another new sacrifice, greater than that of the atomic bomb, let it be the sacrifice of a change in ourselves, each for himself. So this is, what, this is the, the magnitude of Takashi Nagai. He's not just what he did. There is a consequence. I mean, all, all the donations, all the way he helped reconstructing the city. That is the, that is the consequence of the work that he did on himself, of the sacrifice of himself to let go everything that dies and give his life entirely to only what never dies. It's the sacrifice of conversion. I can only conclude this with one sentence, which many of you have probably known several times. The forces that change the history are the forces that change the heart of a man. And this is, I, I have never seen a demonstration so limpid, of, so crystalline of this. The transformation, the conversion of the heart of one person has been able to change an entire city from a cultural, social, political level. And after 70 years, we are here from Japan, Italy, UK, US, talking about these guys, because this is really true. The strength that changes the world in all the struggles we are facing is the power of faith, the conversion of our hearts in faith. So with this, I would like to thank again my friends Chad and Dominic from UK. Thank you very much for taking part in this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again to Somos who made this possible and to all of you who have attended. I can only suggest you to 
to read this beautiful book, which for now you only find on Amazon, which is called Thoughts from Nyokodo. It's by Takashi Nagai. Of course, the book Resurrecting Nagasaki by Chad Deal, and the beautiful movie All That Remains by Dominic and Jan Higgins. And that's how we can continue this adventure. If you have one more minute to spare, I understand. Everybody's tired. I'm tired myself. Not tired of the encounter, just tired physically. Uh, a, cup, a couple of thoughts. You know, we opened the encounter saying that we can build on desire. And I believe that we had a chance to verify that throughout the weekend. What we saw, the people we met, the things we heard, and think of Nagai. I mean, the man didn't have an army. He didn't have a plan. But he lived fully, intensely, what he was given. And with this childlike heart and with his presence and work, changed the world around him and, uh, and gave his, his city life again. So, as Monsignor Albacete would say, something happens, can be the atomic bomb, can be, can be what we're going to read in a second, the discovery of something which has always been there but we've never seen, and uh, can be something that happens at the encounter, can be the encounter. It wakes up our desire so the invitation is be faithful to this desire and let it happen, take over our life. And that, as we have just seen, in God's time bears fruit. Now, Danitz will read us a very, very short passage from Pirandello's Chaula, which is a nickname in dialect for crawl. But it's a human being, as you will hear. And what happens to Chow is precisely what I was hinting to. S suddenly, you see something that you've never seen before. And your desire for full life is reawakened. Be faithful to, to that and let it bear fruit. And in the end, as you will hopefully give Dennis a round of applause, I would like to extend an applause of gratitude to all those who made the encounter possible. More than 300 volunteers, your generosity, our speakers, everybody. Thank you. Chaula discovers the moon. As soon as he came out of the mine, he was astonished. The load fell off his shoulders. He raised his arms slightly. He opened his blackened hands in that silver clarity. Big, peaceful, as in a fresh and luminous ocean of silence, the moon was in front of him. Yes, he knew, he knew what it was but he knew it like many things we know and never care about. And why should Chaula have cared that the moon was in the sky? Now, only now, thus emerging at night from the bowels of the earth, he was discovering her. Ecstatic, he sat down on his load in front of the exit. There she was, over there she was, over there, the moon. The moon was there, the moon. And Chaula started weeping without knowing, without intending to, out of a great consolation, out of a great sweetness, he felt at discovering her over there as she climbed in the sky, the moon with her broad veil of light, oblivious of the mountains, of the plains, of the valleys that she filled with clarity, oblivious of him because of her, he was no longer afraid, nor tired, 
and the night now full of wonder. So thanks again, and God willing, see you next year. <laughs>